of license. Perfect. Perfect. He um, works as a sub well. contractor, yeah. and he d he hires yeah. subs. Yeah. He doesn't pay yeah. subs. He just takes yeah. the yeah. cash. Yeah. He pockets it. Yeah. So we represent the GC, and the GC was paying the subs directly and saying, "You owe me money now because I want to get my project done." Right there, we do the eyes on the by the statue, though, right? Yeah. Well, and the other problem is, unfortunately, in this situation, is the guy doesn't have to be licensed because he's just a project manager. And so you can't even you can't even lodge a complaint against him because it's not it's not him. It will be just more than yeah. Okay, great. I'm glad. Okay, thank you. Oh, look at you. I now call to order the regular session meeting of the Board of Commissions of the City of Tarpa Springs on Tuesday, September 12, 2017 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Lahuzis. Here. Vice Mayor Banther. Here. Commissioner Sieber. Here. Commissioner Kikta. Here. Commissioner Carr. Here. Tonight's invocation will be given by Reverend Smith from Mount Hermon Missionary Baptist Church. If you please stand and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come together tonight to thank you for your many blessings. We're grateful for you allowing us to come to this last month of the year. As we've entered into this season to celebrate the Prince of Priests of Peace, we realize that this world, this, this country, as sometimes are far from it, so we pray for peace for this country, peace for this state, peace for this city. We pray that you continue to bless our city leaders, staff, first responders, citizens, and visitors. We ask your presence in this meeting tonight that you would give wisdom and knowledge. And we ask this to the one who we celebrate the birth of this season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for being here tonight. We are now going to the public comments of the items that will not be discussed tonight. If you have any comments, please come forward. Here none. Thank you. We go to the proclamation, which is the feast day of Epiphany. City of Tarpa Springs, Florida. Proclamation. Whereas His Eminence mm -hmm. Archbishop Demetrius Yeron of America and His Eminence Metropolitan Alexis of Atlanta will be celebrating the feast day of Epiphany. And whereas the city of Tarpa Springs welcomes honor guests, Consul General of Greece Dimitrios Paros, and whereas the city of Tarpa Springs has been identified by history and tradition as the city of the United States with the largest consecutive celebration of the feast day of the Epiphany in the home to the oldest and largest celebration in the United States. And whereas the city of Tarpa Springs has been internationally known and officially designated as the Epiphany City. And whereas the city of Tarpa Springs is home of St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral, the patron saint to sponges, shrimping, and fish and semen. And whereas the feast day of the Epiphany is steadfast 
and truth to be held, to believe and customs rich in a tradition and a culture of the Orthodox Christian faith. And whereas His Eminence and Archbishop Demetrius Yeron of American and His Eminence Metropolitan Alexis of Atlanta has bestowed special honor to the city of Tarbos Springs and the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral for their participation on this special occasion of the feast day of Epiphany. And now, therefore, I crystallize by virtue of the authority vesting in me as the mayor of the city of Tarpa Springs to hereby proclaim January 6, 2018 as a celebration of the 112th anniversary of the feast day of Epiphany. And Father Harris from the uh, Greek Orthodox is here to receive the proclamation. Father, if you come forward, please. Father, would you like to say a few words about our celebration? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. As those who know me know, I'm not actually a man of few words, but tonight I'm just going to say <laughs> we appreciate and we are profoundly aware of the great privilege it is to ask God to bless our city every year. As I go around and I meet with the young men who participate in the blessing service, I am always touched by the awareness, not just of those who have lived here and watch the celebration every year, but always meeting new friends who are aware that all of us together in this year, there may be 20,000 people here because it's a Saturday, where we ask God to come down and uniquely bless Tarpon Springs and the entire Tampa Bay area through the act of blessing the waters of Spring Bayou. So it is our great privilege and blessing that we uh, are allowed the privilege of asking God's blessings on our city. May God com continue to bless the work of our city and our commissioners and all of those public servants who make our lives the blessing that it is to be here in Tarpon Springs. God bless you all. Thank you, Father. Are there any public comments on this item? Here are none. Are there any commission comments? Okay, thank you. Next item on the agenda is the presentation, Spring Bayou Area Update Police Department. Chief well, Coachman. Yep, thank you, Mayor. Um, Major Cho is going to come down. We have a PowerPoint that we're going to do. We just want to update the commission on some of the activity in this area from January through November. It's about 11 months worth of activity. Um, as you know, the police department, other city departments, state, county departments have put a lot of effort into trying to curtail some of the activities going on. Um, especially at Sun Bay and some of the other hotels and the surrounding areas. I think we've had a big impact. Um, it's not 100%. I don't know if we can ever get to 100%. That's just a true statement. But we, I think we really had a big impact overall in, in some of the crime that's occurring in this area. So with that said, I'm going to have um, Major Trill do the PowerPoint, and then we'll, you know, then we'll answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Yeah, there's the time for question and answers at the end. If you have something and you want to interject it, that's fine, because you're the Board of Commissioners. Um, all right, this is the, the PowerPoint is going to be in reference to the activity that we've done in 2017 uh, for the area of Spring Bayou. Uh, you'll see some things when we go through it. Three of the locations are listed here, 57 West Tarpon, 110 West Tarpon, 199 Grand, which you're all familiar with. The study that we did or the, the area with information we're giving you I've never been told that before. And normally, I don't need a mic for you to hear me on the other end of the county. Um, yeah, I'm going to try to stand here. Uh, but the, the three properties are included, but it's not just a, the three properties. You'll see that when we map it. Uh, we map basically almost a two-block area. It'll break it down for you here. The reporting period of time is from January to November 30th. The last month of November, we didn't do like the rest of it. It was a, a, more of an overview for November because we had already had the presentation put together and I just got some more numbers uh, for November. Uh, it covers approximately two blocks, which goes, and you'll see it on the map, it goes basically from Pinellas Avenue out to the backside of Craig Park. 
and from Lemon Street northbound a couple blocks to, to include 199 Grand. The information was obtained from our entries into the computer system, which is the CAD system that we have. It was compiled by our analyst. It was reviewed by me um, and presented in this format for you. If you have questions, we're going to Here's the thing, there's so many different types of calls, we had to cram some together, call it assist citizen, or call it proactive enforcement, rather than having you with 300 different listings of how calls came in. Uh, and th that's broken down in here as well. So you see assist citizen a lot, you'll see proactive enforcement a lot. They uh, encapsulate multiple different kinds of calls. And for instance, assist citizen, I don't need to read them to you because you hopefully grown and can read, but in, in, in <laughs> Anything that we're dealing with citizens in general uh, without major calls for services uh, goes from person down, suicidal, uh, house checks, anything that we're doing uh, for the citizens of the community. You'll see proactive enforcement, area checks directed, patrols, foot patrols, bike patrol, um, special details, problem-oriented policing, surveillance. Those things are all self-initiated. So basically the proactive uh, calls that we have, the majority of them are going to be um, officer officer initiated activity. Uh, so when you see those, you'll see the numbers up there on the map so I can explain it to you. Um, the other thing, the maps give you generalization. So when you see a map, it's kind of hard on the small thing in front of you. When we see it up here, it's gonna be a little easier, but you'll see dots on the map, different color coded dots. They're not specific in the location. It's not GPS that says this is the coordinate for it. So if in other words, if it's at the park, Craig Park, you'll see some on this side of Craig Park and some on this side of Craig Park. That's so you can see the dots, because if we put them all on top of each other, you wouldn't know how many there are, it wouldn't get the effect that you want, and uh, we don't know exactly where within the park all of them occurred. So you'll see that for different locations. It's a generalization. If it's 57 West Tarpon, you'll see them on the top and bottom. It doesn't mean that happened on the top and bottom of the property. Um, now, <clears throat> this is very important. I'm gonna address this multiple times throughout this. Calls for service, do not indicate necessarily a report. Calls for service do not indicate necessarily a crime. Reports do not necessarily indicate a crime. For instance, if I do an, what's called an FIR, you'll see that come up at, at one point. It's called a field interview report. It counts as a report. So if I'm walking down the street or she's walking down the street, I make contact with her and I do what's called a field interview report because I wanted to know who she was, what she was doing in the area, and I wanted to document it. It counts as a report. That didn't mean she committed a crime. Didn't mean it was a call for service. That was just me getting out in the area and contacting someone. If there was a call that came in, and you'll see these, the calls come in, and this is why it's important to understand the statistics and understand how the CAD system works. If you just look online and say, oh my gosh, there was an armed person call. Because if you look at, on, the, on the data that we have, there is an armed person call. The fact is, there was no armed person. How can I say that? because there were five officers standing on the property when the call came in. There was no armed person besides us, which were supposed to be armed, and that's not a crime. So just because a call comes in as something does not mean it was closed that way and does not mean it's legitimate. Now, there are some calls you'll see that are drug calls that were closed out without a report. They might be illegitimate at the time. Someone, uh, uh, for instance, I reviewed all these, and you'll see that. Someone smelled marijuana in the air. They called it as a drug complaint. We got there, there was nobody around, there was no marijuana. So do I believe that that person probably smelled marijuana in the air? The answer is yes. I don't know where exactly where it was occurring, but that does not mean that a, a case came from that because someone said they smelled marijuana. So it's very important to understand that just because you see dots on a screen does not mean that that's a lot of crime. And we're gonna get into that because I'm gonna show you it. Um, we, we pulled out crashes for the most part, traffic, related incidents and crashes. So crash happened at Tarpon and Alternate 19, which many do. We don't count that as part of the um, number of reports that occurred in the area. The other thing is I reviewed these. So as I went through and looked at them, if it said something like drug call, disorderly conduct, something like that, I pulled all the reports that were written. If there wasn't a report written, I pulled the CAD notes to go through to see, hey, why wasn't a report written? And the, normally, not all the time, normally officers will put in, hey, this is going on, it wasn't a crime. Or I dealt with this person, a suspicious person, hey, it was, and we're gonna get to that. The other one on here is um, gunshots. Gunshots were heard, you'll see it on the dot, it'll say gunshot, red dot on it. July 1st, anyone wanna take a guess what it actually was? Fireworks. Very, 
Oh, good, good class. It was fireworks, so it comes up as a gunshot. So if you're just getting online and you're going, look at the calls for service, look at the calls that are going on, there's gunshots in the area. If you don't have the information, you don't know. So, so sometimes stats can be misunderstood, they can mis be misinterpreted, and they can be misused. I'm not here to misuse any stats. I'm just here to lay it out for you, the calls for service that we got from the Cadney Police Activity. Um, what was it? Recently, we just had one that was um, a stolen vehicle. Someone said, hey, there was a stolen vehicle in the area. Well, it comes up on the screen, stolen vehicle. People go, oh my gosh, there's a stolen vehicle. It was a citizen assist because the person forgot where they parked their car. But if so, if you look on, online, you see the dot, stolen vehicle, look at the crime going on. The female forgot where she put her car. We found it and we took care of it for her because we protect and serve. Um, <clears throat> Again, reports don't necessarily indicate criminal activity, and you'll see when there's a criminal charge on these cases, I put a yellow asterisk, and that's to, for, for to, uh, to show us, hey, this is not just a report, it's a criminal charge that occurred. The other one is, I tried my best, based on what we had, to show the relationship between the calls for service and those three properties. Um, I will tell you right now, I guarantee you there are crimes that have been undetected that happened that we didn't either weren't called on, we got there, they'd already happened, and we didn't have evidence to support it because the person was uh, gone on arrival, GOA, and things happen when we're not there. I understand that. There also, I understand, and you need to understand that sometimes if we're doing surveillance or we're doing traffic uh, as part of our uh, problem-oriented policing, we might stop a car a half a mile, quarter mile away. Unless it was linked to that address, uh, we don't have it as related. Do I believe those exist? Absolutely. Um, but again, the numbers aren't going to, I think, explode off that from when we link it to it. But, so if you see a, the relationship, it'll say unrelated or related. If it's unrelated, there's no evidence for us to believe that it was related to these three addresses. If it's related, normally is, is it occurring on the property or is it occurring from someone on the property that had just left the property. Does that make sense? Um, there was a case, you'll see, the person lived at the property, it was a crime, it was a fraud, it didn't occur at the property, it didn't occur because of the property, it was someone's credit card had been uh, fraudulently used, the person was just living at the property. So I didn't consider that related to the property because it didn't occur there. So with that being said, let's look at January. This is the police activity for the month of January for basically the two block area. For those of you who have a larger one, if you have small ones, you're probably not gonna see a lot of dots, especially if you have 48 year old eyes like I do. On the board, you'll see the dots. Now, if you look at that again, if you got online and looked at that and you'd go, holy cow, there's a whole lot of activity in this area. But if you'll notice the yellow ones themselves are actually, you see this recurring throughout, the yellow ones are proactive policing, proactive activity by the police, area checks, stops, contacts, directed patrols. So if we take those away, that's actually what the calls for service look like in, in the uh, area, the mapped area, which is roughly about two blocks and the calls for service. And you'll see, again, we don't consider the accident hit and runs, we just note them. We don't consider that as part of reports because they don't really associate it with it, just happened to be in the area. Alarm calls, um, armed person calls, assault call, battery call, disturbance, and theft. We had five of them. Again, that does not mean we had five crimes. That means we had five calls for service that were titled as such. And again, it breaks it down. It says citizen disorderly conduct or, or person or suspicious person or vehicle and drug call. Um, last is proactive enforcement. So if you look at the breakdown of it, 147 police activity occurred for the month of January. Out of that, 111 was proactive policing, meaning we were there checking up on things, um, doing area checks, and et cetera, that, that is broken down under proactive policing. Out of that 111, two resulted in a report. One was a trespass, which is not a crime. It's the manager of Sun Bay wanted somebody gone from the property, so we issued the trespass. That's not a crime, so it's just a report. If they would come back, it would be a crime, but he wanted them gone, and we actually issued him a trespass warning. The other one was a possession charge of narcotics and actually had a relationship with 110 West Tarpon. Uh, the calls for service, there were 10. So if you break it down, 76% of the calls, or 76% of the total activity was police doing what we do. 
7% were calls that resulted in a report. So 10 reports for the month of January in that area. And again, that's in the area, as you see, unrelated, unrelated, both related, one related, uh, one domestic battery related, and a missing person adult was related. So out of those, there were two criminal charges that resulted, uh, actually three if you count the, the proactive. There were two calls for service that re resulted in a criminal charge or criminal charge occurred, uh, criminal violation occurred, and one was for um, self-initiated activities. So out of the 10 or out of the 12 reports total, three were uh, criminal for the mo whole month. We look at February, we see very much the same thing. And as you see, again, there's a heavy, I'll turn it off so you guys can't see it. There's a heavy uh, concentration right here of yellow dots. The, again, those are all proactive enforcement. So it looks like a lot going on between the motels, but that's it. Again, here's the breakdown for February. You'll see some of the similar numbers. 103 was, was uh, 103 of the activity was proactive enforcement. 141 was the total. 103 was what we did on our own, and nine reports, which is six percent of the calls or incidences uh, activity, resulted in a report. Out of those, it looks like again two were related to the. Uh, properties that were criminal, and some other one was related that were not criminal. March breakdown again, looks very similar to the other one. You'll see the numbers actually start to come down because we had less activity, which we had less than proactivity in there as well because the, the, the calls for service also uh, somewhat diminished. 108 and 66 were self-initiated, proactive, and only two reports, one of which was an FIR. So there was one crime and that was a battery which was, a, a, I believe, domestic-related. April looks very similar again. These are the calls for service. You'll see 72 total. 50 of those were proactive, which is 69%. And again, we're sticking around the 6, 7, 8 uh, percentage for calls for service. I don't see any criminal ones in that month that we uh, had for a report that were related to the location anyways. May, 110 total, 65 uh, proactive. And again, we picked up some proactive arrests, a couple of warrant arrests from the hotel. At, uh, one was related to Tarpon Inn and a narcotics one at 199 grand. And uh, they're starred, the ordinance violations technically aren't a criminal violation, they're a city ordinance violation, but I put them up there anyways because they go to jail under the ordinance. June. 74 total, 42 were proactive, um, five reports, and again, uh, no criminal ones reported at that time for the month of June. And you'll notice over the months, if you look, um, there you go again, the suspicious person calls uh, in the area mainly focus around the park. We had more suspicious person, suspicious vehicle calls from Craig Park than we did the hotels and the uh, 199 grand. Um, and again, does that mean that criminal activity was going on? No. I mean, we've had them where it came from the, one of the hotels was a suspicious vehicle and it was an Uber driver that was waiting for his fare. Another guy that new to the area kind of pulled over to use the phone uh, and he was contacted. So again, it's not always criminal activity or what we would consider suspicious. It's just called in as such. We'll go to August, 75 total, proactive 40, which is 53%. I believe that's going to be the lowest percentage of proactive of the year, which is still over half of the activity is us out there looking for stuff. Um, and again, four reports taken for July, and, and no criminals on that one. August, 49 total incidences, 30 which were us and five reports, two of which were related. And again, when I put the crime that was related on thefts, uh, one or two of them were actually the hotel being the victim of a theft. So the theft occurred there, but they were the victim. Um, another one was somebody had checked out, left their purse, came back, and then said stuff was missing from the purse, even though it was in the same place under the bed. So I can't talk to the legitimacy of that call because the, call, the purse was still there, but it, they said that it was missing things. September, 
94 total, 52 were us, two warrant arrests related to the, the tarpon in, one battery related to the tarpon in, and a narcotics position, possession uh, to the 199 grand. Now, I will tell you, again, these drug calls that we've had, you'll see them marked up on, on there. Uh, at least, I believe, three of them that I researched were information about drug sales believed to be going on on the property of 199 grand. When I reviewed it, the information I believe was a valid information that we received at that time based on the, the information on the who was doing what they were doing, and I'm familiar with that. So it came in as a drug call. It doesn't necessarily mean drug uh, activity was going on at the time, but some people said, hey, by the way, this guy's selling drugs. This is where he lives, et cetera. Um, and there was some legitimacy to that. October. 67 total, 34 was us. That's the lowest, 51%. I knew it was over 50%. Um, again, calls for service resulting in report four and one was an arrest. Now, if you go back one month and look, you'll say, wow, September kind of picked up because they had 10 arrests and now the, the percentage is in double digits, which is 11%. But if you look at the bottom, one incident resulted in three reports the same day because of one went from the person kind of was at one hotel they wanted them to trespass, went to the other hotel, an animal complaint from that person. And then if you look at October, they came back and they got arrested. So they're the one that calls the criminal one. So one person was kicked out of both hotels, came back to one and they said, let's arrest them. So that's our criminal uh, charge for the month on October. All right, so we got through October and we looked at these stats and said, well, you know, calls for service kind of came down. Overall, the calls came down, our response as well, we're steady through there with over 50% of the stuff that was going on was us. So we wanted to see whether or not our belief that some of the problems were quelled, not that it was resolved 100% as the chief said, we know that's not to be the truth. We know that there's still crime that goes on that we don't catch, undetected crime. We know that crime occurs that we don't get called at. But let's pick it up because I've been to city commission meetings. I've heard people say, I can see this crime. I can see this crime. This is going on every day. So I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick up enforcement. We're going to do more police uh, problem-oriented policing in the area. I want area checks there, uh, a tremendous amount of area checks uh, over the, the last couple weeks of November. I said, this is what I want. I want you to see... If there's a, a certain time, if this is going on, and if there's a certain time this is going on. So we did 133 directed patrols, area checks, pop surveillances, contacts at the three addresses. Now this, this takes out before you saw a bunch of proactivity with numbers, but that was just in the area. These were specific to these three addresses. I said, this is what I want. I want you to go out because I'd heard, hey, in the early mornings, I, I probably heard the same thing, in the early morning, this crime is going on. It's rampant, it's overt. I sent them out early morning to do surveillance in the place and it wasn't occurring. Um, what I did is I wanted them to go back throughout the day. We work 12 hour shifts. I have four shifts that alternate, so I have two days and two evenings. They're always working. I said, I want them out there. I want you to see when you're working, stop by. You go out to a call, I want you to come back and look and see what's going on. So 133 uh, patrols, uh, director patrols, area checks. We had the bike team out there, the pop surveillance, and we just don't see the increase like people have said. Um, we do believe that, does crime still occur there? Absolutely. Are we still getting some calls for service? Absolutely. Is it the most egregious place within the city? Probably not. There's other places that have lots of calls for service. There's other places that have um, crimes that go on. There's, it, it, it does occur, but it's not to the degree that we were advised. For the year, the two block zone, 1,154 incidents is what we had, adding those up. 769 were proactive, which is 67% of it. And the calls for service, other calls for service, were 385. Not reports, but, but calls for service, 385. If you look at that for 11 months, it's about, let's see, 11 divided by that is almost four, three to four calls. Um, it's not that egregious of uh, taking our time up. Does it take time up? Absolutely. Does crime interfere with our job? Absolutely. Uh, would we like to see no crime in Tarpon Springs? Absolutely. But these are the stats that we've uh, ran through that. I don't have to go over this. It's in there, and we've already addressed this when we met with you before. This is just 
kind of a covering, what we've done. He, the chief already mentioned, we addressed this with patrol. We've addressed this with detectives, with special uh, surveillance. We've addressed this with our peace team uh, by putting our peace team out there to do surveillance. Um, we've addressed this with code enforcement with different areas of the city getting the building department, the fire department, other departments within the city on board, contacted the state, and we've come at the, from different angles to solve this problem. Um, we've had meetings, we've increased our presence, we've done over and covert activity there to watch and to actually show our presence there. Uh, we've done knock and talks where we've gone up the rooms, knocked on the door to make contact, to show the presence there, um, et cetera. We're still tracking any kind of cases that come in. We will still follow them up. Uh, we have trespass authorizations for both property, uh, for both properties, so we can issue trespass warnings for them. Um, we've increased our crime prevention in the area as well. That was in the past. Um, and again, back to this, we understand that crime occurs in the property or related to the property, which is unreported or undetected. We know that goes on. I talked to a gentleman I know, and he says, I watched a drug deal go on. Not belittling that, not doubting it. I believe he watched a drug deal go on. Not everybody that sees something knows what a drug deal is because we've had them again. Hey, this is drug deal going on. You go out there and they're actually picking up a fare. Um, understand that there are reports or arrests that may have been related, but were not linked. We discussed that and understand that lower priced hotels with little amenities can be a location for problems that are present. It's going to happen. Um, there's, uh, there was a concern for heavy uh, criminal activity in the area. Through the proactive and calls for service that we looked at, we looked at 15 criminal cases uh, related to the property. Two ordinance violations, 15 uh, criminal cases in, that would be 11 months. So that's a little over one a month. Total reports in the area were 74. Related reports were in 41. Again, that doesn't mean criminal. That just means reports for service. Um, Concern for police presence in the area. We need more police presence. 937 total incidents, 593 were proactive. Uh, or, yeah, which was 63% of the activity that occurred was proactive by the police. That's January through October. And last, concern for blatant, uh, continual blatant criminal activity through these three addresses. We addressed that with a POP. Uh, with 125 directed patrols and area checks, eight POP surveillances were uh, initiated and it just wasn't there. We did not see that um, criminal blatant activity out there that we can make arrests on. Um, trust me, we would if we could. Any questions? Major, thank you uh, for the update. And I'm very glad that uh, the data that you provide us is very positive and the crime activity has been reduced. How do you compare this year with the previous year in regards to the, uh, to the crime activity? I'd have to do the numbers on it? No. just You want off the top of my head? I, I believe we've had an impact on it, absolutely. Um, I've worked the street now. Again, when I say it hasn't, it still goes on. Last month, I, went, I like to work at night sometimes and come in. Uh, I came in, I did surveillance at 57 West Tarpon for about 45 minutes one afternoon. There was nothing going on other than the gentleman that was staying there knew who I was. He came out and started talking to me for a little while. Um, I did it later on in the evening at 110, and I actually did end up making an arrest that was related to that. Um, a vehicle had come up. I stopped him several blocks away. And so I know that crime still goes on. I immediately went back to the hotel. I said, this is what's going on. This is the information. And we, uh, we got the person trespassed immediately. Didn't want him on the property. Thank you. Uh, I believe if we are continue the police presence on that locations, I think it's going to continue reducing the crime. And also, I believe that uh, the, uh, the, the residents and the business owners are going to regain their confidence and they feel um, safer for themselves. I think she, well, you know, the approach that you use is the right approach. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kick. Thank you. Um, thank you for this report. It, this was um, well overdue, I believe. Uh, we've, been, we've all been contacted, uh, as we all know, from citizens here in the community about some of these reports that you're saying and, you know, like the, the stolen vehicle. It wasn't stolen. It was... Misplaced. 
Exactly. At best. So, um, so a lot of the, the citizens don't see the real story sometimes. So we really needed this this kind of an update, and I really do appreciate it. And we have, and just the numbers alone are showing that your presence is making a difference. The numbers are going down. The crime is going down. Unfortunately, it is taking a lot of the police department's time to to um, patrol that area. <clears throat> and so, you know, I know you did lighting and. Uh, uh, you cut trees back and you some other, you have cameras out there and stuff now. So I'm not sure how much that is helping. I don't know if and they're connected to the police department. So <laughs> you're able to watch what's going on on the property from the police department? Or? On one of the properties, they've given us a code and that was for their, for their cameras. That was when he got them. That's initially, it was the last owner before he passed away of 110 West Tarpon. That's, um, as for the, the, the area itself, it is rather centrally located. Um, so we pass that going out to the west side of town. Uh, so even if it's not, without me telling guys, hey, I want you to go to this area, they're going by, whether it's to go to the docks that back way or go to the west side of town, they're constantly passing that. That's why there are, there are so many as well, is because it, it's rather centrally located as we go Downtown, we just continue downtown. If we're going to the docks, we can go that way as well, or to the west side of town, we'll pass that place and log area checks. So it's it's part of what we do. It's we we do that all over town with the area checks and directed patrols. The 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 officers that are working nights, I think um, there's been some reference on Facebook about you know how how dangerous it is for them that work nights and they have to go out to their you know to to patrol those areas. And we please we appreciate everything that law enforcement does for us day and night and i know it, it does they, you know it is dangerous for them but again like i said the presence has really shown in the numbers that what you're doing is good and i i I, to I i support this and i really appreciate what you have done crime is everywhere and you know yeah we would love to see no crime but that's in a perfect world but i think uh, i want to thank everybody thank um you know, all the police officers for a great job and, and to continue uh, and keep up the good work. Thank you. I, I, I thank you, Major. I first want to thank that the police department is very, when, I, when, you, when you see the stats and that the majority is proactive, that, that you all take that role with no direction from us. And not, 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 not that you would need that, but it wasn't that you all didn't do that before and we had to tell you to do that. So it's encouraging that we're getting that on the back end, and that we have to, and that we have so much presence there. So I think that is a big deterrent, um, the uh, the most you can. And I appreciate how how you separated those those calls for us. So for the year, I think you had seven hundred and sixty nine proactive, and three eighty five calls. You know, I kind of uh, group them together when it comes to our resources we're expending because you're still having to go out there. But it, but it helps that you uh, broke them up. Um, we, I, I would be in support of whatever more proactive things the police department feels that they need for that area. There, there's, you know, <laughs> been talks of you know, more extreme measures of when the salon bayou moves out, if we rent that space, or, or extra patrol, or whatever. Whatever you all feel you need to support that area, I'm, I, I'm in full support of. Okay, um, and uh, my, my first question is: Is there? We do. You talk about this, uh, this two block radius. Um, you know, without getting too specific, I know we, we don't have all the stats in front of us. You know, what other areas in the city have more crime than these two block areas? If you were to kind of divvy them up. Uh, it, it depends, because when we, we, are you just talking calls for service, calls crimes? For, yes, as, because as if you look cost. up at Tarpon and 19, it's going to be, Tarpon and 19, that intersection is going to be much greater mm -hmm. for calls for service and much greater for probably criminal activity um, because there's some businesses that will have 15 and such re retail Walmart. thefts yeah. in, in a very short period of time, sometimes multiple times a day. So the calls for service there, we have other areas of town that we've had more severe uh, crimes. Uh, obviously, it was a murder here. We all know that. But ongoing throughout the year that was one incidence of a murder uh, throughout the year there's been more violent crimes in other areas of the city as well and um again i, I just want to reiterate that yes we are spending time doing that 
but area checks as part of as part of our business. If you look, I have I ran the stats for the last year, not the same time frame for one officer, and he had 1,900 proactive uh, incidences. Another one had 1,700 proactive incidences. That's 3,600 just for two officers for about a year. That's them getting out, and that's all over the city. They're constantly checking. They're constantly proactive. Um, I think it'd be helpful to have this quarterly chief, you know, as moving forward until we, well, well, we'll never solve the problem down there, but until we, or if we come to a solution on this board. Um, uh, as far as, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I would think that, you know, there's probably, a, you know, if you took out the retail factor, there's probably maybe one other place in town that we're devoting this much resources to um, for crime. And, and that's one reason why I have supported the, re the redevelopment efforts that I've said before on this board. Um, I do think, uh, I, know, I know the police department is 100%, um, but we, we do need to be sympathetic to the emails we get and the calls we get of people that live and work in that area because that, they face a, a different reality. You know, while the numbers say one thing, what they see and what they feel is important to them and should be important to us. And if any of us live there or had businesses there, I think some might have a different story. So um, I appreciate the way that the police department has been, I think, bent over backwards for everybody down there in your proactive calls and responding to calls and uh, treating every, every, everybody fairly. And uh, that, that, that's, all, that, 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 that's all I have for now. The rest of my comments will be saved when we talk about the uh, property purchase again. But I would like to have this update again, at least maybe March or April, or April, I would say. So we have the first quarter of 2018 uh, covered. Th thank you, Major. Thank you. Thank you, Major Trill. Uh, this was quite interesting um, and surprising in many ways. I know because of your proactive activity out there, there have been a lot of calls. But you said uh, that you go through that area anyway to go to the docks or the, the west end of, of, uh, of Tarpon Springs. And there are other areas in town that you know we also are concerned about. As as I did a ride along, I, I know where some of those places were that that we you know more proactively um, went to. Uh, so 385 calls in in 11 months is um, not as severe as as we believed, I guess, from the the citizens who call us. And I live in that area, so I do live around the corner from there. Uh, and I'm just as concerned as as uh, everyone else. But uh, this was interesting because it's, um, you know, we do get the calls and we get people who are very concerned and think that activity is going on 24-7. And um, so I'm, I'm happy for your proactive um, behavior. And, uh, and also another thing that's interesting is I looked at the three uh, addresses. Uh, we've been talking a lot about 57 uh, West Tarpon, but it looks like more incidents have happened on, on um at the Tarpon Inn and on 199 Grand. So there are quite a few incidents at those other areas. So one is not the only problem, all three are. So that's, uh, that's something important to keep in mind. But thank you for your, for your work. Commissioner Kaur. Thanks for the update, Major. Um, a question for you. I noticed a recurring theme was a arrest for a warrant. Is that typical for other parts of the cities? I don't, I'm not really sure. Arrest warrants Absolutely. happen a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. All, all over, over the place. All if over. we come in contact with them and we run them, and they, they could be from wherever. Like pulling someone over, like sort of speeding ticket or running a stop sign. They got or, a warrant or, or, or yeah, if they, if, if they had a charge of a crime somewhere, they didn't take care of it in court, and they got a notice to appear, a lot of times it's FTA, or sometimes it's direct file, where if you do something, they take it to the state attorney, they investigate and go, let's issue a warrant for his arrest. So there are a lot of warrants in fact we get online and we run all the warrants um and go out and try to find people with warrants wow, okay. so yeah it's not out of the ordinary I hear that you're proactive and uh, again i really appreciate the the proactiveness that the police department has taken um overall um we just as a city as a whole i mean that's encouraging for the citizens and myself as well um one thing that's uh, two things that stuck out to me um one was you mentioned that low fares will continue to, to attract questionable activity that's just something to be aware of i think that's a very true statement that you made um I mean, it's an area it's a cyclical situation so um in the past we've seen it gotten really bad and it cleans up and gets really bad and cleans up and gets really bad and cleans up so um i think just the continuing the proactiveness in the area is an important part to 
keep it from getting really bad again. Um, and then the other part we have to be aware of is when tourists or other people just go online, they don't necessarily understand what Major Trill is t presented to us tonight. They're looking at the total calls. So if you're a tourist and you're looking to maybe visit a certain area or stay in a certain area, that could be discouraging as well. So although Major Trill said that there's only a small amount of actual criminal activities, if these calls are still public and people are seeing it online, that's still a potential discouragement to people that want to visit our town. So um, it's encouraging that the criminal activity has decreased, but from per per perception, of someone looking from the outside, they don't know that those aren't criminal activities. Um, so thanks a lot for the presentation and everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to the public comments on this item. Does anyone have any uh, public comments? Yes. Please state your name and your address for the record. You got four minutes. Good evening. My name is Darlene Vatti Kiotis. I live at 49 West Center Street in Tarpon Springs. I've spoken to you before. I am the Homeowner Association President for Villa Plamosa. We have a number of residents that are more senior in age than even myself and have ongoing concerns. And I want to commend the Major as well as Captain Cochin. The um, surveillance has been going on. And did I promote you? Or I demoted you. Demoted him. Sorry. I have a problem. I'm so sorry. It's a blessing. Sorry about that. Yeah. In the Navy, a captain is higher than, than a major. Um, my point being that I have appreciated the, the um, additional lighting that's been put in place. I mean, it's almost stadium lighting, and it's, it's done great. I actually live on Center Street, and I see a lot of this activity, as do some of our residents. But I appreciate the lighting. I appreciate the surveillance. You all have done a, um, an excellent job. My, my continued concern, and this is just an aside, the Neighborhood Watch came into being. We had our uh, residents participate in that, but it's kind of just fallen to the way. We don't seem to get anything directly from our representatives of the Neighborhood Watch for Villa Plamosa, and if that could be followed up on, I'd appreciate that a lot. The other question I have for the Major is, piggybacking what, what David and some of the others said, while this may not be the worst, this is certainly one of the most visible golden crescents in our city. And I find that any scurrilous activity here is very disheartening. But you have done a lot of surveillance. You've been in our parking lot, specifically looking at 199 Grand, and, and that is a, a sore port for us. But um, once again, well done, this report while uh, Commissioner Kitka said is well overdue, I think we have to stay on top of this. I, th I think we need to be doing this on a regular basis. And um, my group is very much in support of any help that we can provide to you. There was a mention at one time of having cameras installed at Villa Plamosa because of the unique location of our community. Uh, that hasn't gone anywhere. We would still be interested in that if it's a help to the police department. But thank you so much. I appreciate the uh, the information. I was here for public art. This was an added bonus for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Good evening. First off, may I support and uh, say thanks to the chief and the major uh, for all their efforts to put together a very concise and professional overview for us. And a couple of things that I would like to kind of highlight, and I think, say, <laughs> gotta remember to say major now, Trill, uh, pointed out Now on one page, police approach this way in the back says, held community meeting on 9-12-16. That was the big blow up, okay? Let's look at the stats. January, 147 incidents, 111 proactive. February, 141 to 103. March, 108 to 66. 
April 72 to 50. May um, 110.65, June 74.42, July 75.40, August 49.30, September 94.52, and 67.34. What's the general trend, as Commissioner Kitna pointed out, Increased surveillance, increased knowledge about what's going on in the area has, in a sense, in some ways, also deterred the criminal activity that might have been there. They know it's being watched more and people are calling and all that stuff. But what really uh, impresses me is the fact that, as Officer or Major Trill stated, is that there are other areas that have just as much significant crime that the people who are crying to buy this property for are afraid of. And I will dispute your aspect of how people would look at the calls. Because if anybody wants to look in Pinellas County as to where to stay, I'm sure Clearwater Beach and Clearwater and some parts of San Pete and Tampa have more calls that would scare people away than what's going on here in Tarpon. So let's put it in perspective to the area, because overall, I would have to say, Tarpon is a pretty safe place to be. Now, again, we come back to the point. Is it really worth to consider spending all this time for attorneys and appraisals to purchase this property? As the reports has been indicated, there's other areas with as much crime. Are we gonna start going around buying all these other properties? You have an issue coming up later for the forward Pinellas that you're gonna donate 20,000 or give grant from the CRA. You got your facade grants, you got your restaurant grants. All these things are out of that money. So, I would say you really need to start taking a hard look on the relativeness of continuing to still to pursue purchasing this property. Otherwise, if that's your attitude, you'll be buying property all over Tarpon. And that's not what we need you to do. Let the free market aspect take over and do the thing that is necessary to improve the area. <coughs> if it's such a golden crescent and it has this value then investors as it's been mentioned previously can come and purchase the property themselves and not us and then transfer it to them at a discount thank you thank you are there any other public comments on this item here none again uh major trill i want to thank you i want to thank the police department for doing an excellent job, and you always have our respect and our support. Thank you, sir. Can I ask one, one additional question? Sure. Uh, at 110 Tarpon, I know that they had the cameras that are uh, that you can see at, at the police department. Since that owner passed away, are you still? It's continuing. It, it has yes. continued? Okay. Yes. I was curious about that because yep. I knew that he was gone. All right. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to the uh, consent agenda. Item number three is the attorney fees, invoice 55204. <clears throat> number four is the special events. A is Glendy, January 6, 2017. B is the Sunset Beach Concert Series from February to November 2008. Number five is the award file number 180059 and RS single source purchase of pump and motor repair parts and maintenance. Number six is to authorize execution of the trolley service agreement, North County cost of route and amendment uh, to cost of route funding agreement. And number seven is the award bid 180031-B-CM yard waste disposal. Are there any items that you'd like to pull? Just got a question. I'm not sure if the city manager could help me out with Which it. Which one? It's number six. Six, do you want to pull it? 
Like, don't ask me questions. Just a question. Um, I was looking at the different cities, and I saw Clearwater is paying like 1.4 percent. It's about 14,000, and Dunedin, Pinellas County, and Tarpon Springs are paying three and a half percent each. Do you know why the city of Clearwater is so less compared to Dunedin, Pinellas County, and Tarpon? Yeah, in, in fact, way back from the beginning of the trial, the agreement, um, all they really do is really, in perspective, um, they're putting in anything. Because all right, that deals with their hub. I mean, they've already got their hub there and everything. They're just contributing to the route. The advantage isn't the, the, the trolley and this agreement doesn't really give them any advantage that they had before. Um, it's to the counties that it go to. But they agreed to kick in money to the service stuff. So, so this it, is a separate route then that runs from the, oh, the, it, from the beach? It's to... the same, but in perspective, they really wouldn't have to kick anything in when this thing, but they agreed to kick the money into it um, with a cooperative de deal with all the cities. Um, but the trolley route doesn't really help them because they already had the hub. They already had the route to the hub. So... Um, this, this goes back way to this thing at the beginning of the, when this was done. It's really the cities of Dunedin, the county, and us that get the advantage of that. So this has been from the very start many, many years ago. Okay. Thank the you. breakdown. Mr. LaCourse, uh, I just have a question to ask. Mm -hmm. The fare box collection has been reduced. Is the uh, ridership also being reduced as well? Do we get more people using that trolley? Or less. Uh, the statistics show more. Again, this agreement, we, we already saw the numbers of this and agreed to everything. We just, for some reason, didn't get the contract to actually execute. So this has been going on since October. Um, so they are supposed to bring you the new stats. So this isn't something we're approved. This is something, um, again, that's been in effect. So they, they said they were going to bring those numbers. As they review the numbers over the season and stuff, they'll be coming back to you and bringing these to see if they went up or down or anywhere okay. and stuff. This is just kind of a housekeeping measure. We already approved all this back in, you know, September and September. They're just getting the contract up to us. Um, for some reason, they never got the contract up to officially approve and sign. So, mm -hmm. so but they are, they are coming sometime January, February, or when the season goes, they got the good numbers, and they'll be making presentations yeah. for you. And then you can ask them all the questions about the fare box and the different things that have gone on with it. <laughs> Yeah, I'd just like to let everybody know that the purpose of this trolley service was to bring visitors from Clearwater Beach to Tarpon Springs. So I think it's working well. Since we're on number six, could I ask something? I know I, I brought this up last year. Uh, they've changed the route since it first started so that now they're going through Clearwater, stopping at the hub. It, it can take up to an hour and a half to get to Clearwater Beach. So I had suggested last year that we have maybe three or four direct routes um, during the day, and the rest can still go through the hub and whatever, but nothing came of that. So I'd still like to see if we can do that because any tourist doesn't want to spend six hours on the trolley going to the beach and coming back. I know I've done it taking visitors, and it's, you know, it's a very long ride. Uh, so Supposedly they're working on relieving that. Again, that's another thing when they come up and analyze what they've done from October this season. They'll be coming to talk to you about. And, uh, and again, we, we can to express to them to make some changes. But they're supposed to, you know, at busy times, they're adding, try, they're supposedly doing things to try to keep that number down. But again, once they have the figures, at least four months, you know, probably October to January, uh, I say we'll be scheduling them to come before you and, and talk to you about that. And then we can get all those questions you, you got about those kind of things. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Delacos, this is for the whole agenda, for the whole consent agenda, not just for that item. Right, I'm just... Any of the items, if you have Right, any. but I'm here on the coastal one, okay. the Jolly Trolley you're speaking about. Uh, thank you, Peter Delacos, 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see here on the note here, it says this request for an increase is based on the following <coughs> factors, and it says fare box recovery. Projected fare collection on the coastal route has decreased from 23.5% to 18.5%. I think I addressed the board here once before about riding the trolley, and there is no system of accountability of where the money goes and it's counted. And again, I'm not going to say any of the drivers are unscrupulous or anything else. However, again, 
this leads me to wonder about that aspect. Secondly, we all got our tax bills. There's a line there that says PSTA. We're paying for PSTA and they have abandoned us. I used to be able to catch the 66 bus in the afternoon. There is no 66 bus. They have pulled back and allowed the jolly, jolly trolley to take those afternoon. And if you look at a schedule from like, they only run the 66 early in the morning and a couple at night. And the rest during the day is the trolley. So even though we're paying PSTA, they're giving us less service on the 66 and we now have to come from the city to put more money into the trolley to cover us what PSTA was covering us already. So in a sense, it's almost like getting double billed. Thank you. Any other, any other public comments on these items? Here none, I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Banther? Yes. Mayor Alahuzas? Yes, thank you. We're now going to the item number eight, which is the award file number 180044 and RS Public Art Nayed Sculptures. Ms. Orr? Yes, good evening uh, to the Mayor and the Board of Commissioners. Uh, I am Sherry Orr. I am Chair of the Public Art Committee. I think we're ready. Very good. Um, each of you has a packet that's similar to what you're seeing. Uh, tonight we are presenting uh, work done by Glenna Goodacre, uh, who is a very well-known artist in the United States and has made many things that are memorable. Um, she's called America's Sculptor and has created over 500 works of art. Uh, so in her 40-year career, she has accomplished quite a bit. And in her sculpture, she's most known, as you can see, for the expressiveness of her work and how lively her compositions are, which you'll see some examples. If we were to go to Sarasota, uh, we could see this example. It's called the Olympic Wannabes. And uh, this one's in Selby Five Points Park, and they paid $180,000 for this work. Uh, this is another one, uh, The Facts of Life, which is in the Van Weasel Amphitheater. Um, so you can see by the expressions, and they really look as if they're children chatting on the uh, wall. But today we're talking about Tarpon Springs and our need and opportunity. Uh, these are the naiads, and they represent Greek mythological, mythological nature goddesses. The naiads are in charge of the element of water, and you know we're surrounded by water. They're cast in bronze, and they're impervious to climate. This shows you uh, the size. Uh, this is one of the members of our committee and uh, the expressiveness of the features. Currently, these sculptures are available in Sarasota through the Galleria Selecki, and Mr. and Mrs. Selecki are here tonight from Sarasota. Uh, the Good Acre supports placement of her artist proof set of the naiads in a public setting and is offering them to Tarpon Springs for $75,000 plus $800 shipping from Sarasota. You compare that price to what Sarasota paid for their sculptures, but there is a per reason. This shows you, um, we were um, approached um, about having a sculpture in uh, the roundabout down at the docks. And um, 
and this is another one of our members who is showing the size where this uh, sculpture would be placed with the four ladies. And um, we still would have to do some in-ground lighting and uh, some base work. Uh, about uh, two years ago, the Sponge Docks merchants came to us and asked for a sculpture in this location. And um, this is a location where it is very busy, as we all know, and that people would come. And the name recognition of this artist would be wonderful. You talk about bringing people into the community. People will travel here to see this art. In addition to the first sculpture, there's a second opportunity for our community. Um, Miss Goodacre is in very poor health, and she no longer is working, and, uh, but she only has one more sculpture left, and this is called Storybook Time. It is in bronze. It is in Sarasota. They have offered us this piece for $50,000, which once again is considerably under what other sculptures had gone for. Um, with the shipping cost, uh, they would only charge us $200 to ship this to Tarpon Springs. This is called Storybook Time. Notice uh, this is the Cultural Center, and if we look at the location, the grassy knoll beside it, um, that would be a perfect spot because in 1916, our first library was located on the second floor of the Cultural Center. And we are prepared to pay for these costs out of our funds that we have available right now. Uh, the sculptures can be placed in storage until we can prepare the sites. Uh, the site prep cost for storybook time would be minimal. Um, we can work with artists to get the design for the base for uh, the docks. And a review of our total cost would be, the naiads, the set of four sculptures would be 75,000. The storybook time with the bench would be 50,000. Shipping for all of the pieces from Sarasota would be $1,000. The total cost for all sculptures would be $126,000. Currently, we have $376,775 <coughs> in our working budget. With this cost, we would have a remaining $250,775 left to do additional projects which we were bringing to you on January 23rd. <coughs> Are there any questions? Mrs. Orr, thank you for uh, the presentation and I also like to thank the uh, Public Art Committee members <coughs> that are here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your work and the uh, project that you're working with, the uh, bicycle rack, beautifying the area that looks beautiful. Thank you for that. I believe that um, the naiads, the Nereides, as they call them in the Greek mythology, they are the perfect sculptures for the area down at the Sponge Ducks on the circle. I think they are deserved to be right by the water. And I did some research, and because I do remember everything from school, but um, they, are, they are the brights of the rivers for the streams, the lakes, the fountains, and the spring. But, and according to mythology, these gardens are also many islands that were named after them, including Egina, Salamis, Evia, Samia, and Kerkira. Um, also, uh, those statues usually accompanied by uh, Poseidon, the god of the sea, who's friendly to uh, and protector of the sailors. So it looks like the, pre the place is appropriate for uh, the city of Carver Springs down at the dock. Thank, thank you. you. Vice Mayor Panther. Yes, thank you. I want to thank your committee for all the work that you do. It's certainly an area of expertise I do not possess, so I depend upon you all for these items. 
Um, I would encourage you all to um, not be more active in, in the sense that you all haven't been active, but, um, you know, I, I kind of want to see the funds used more frequently. These are, <laughs> this is essentially a tax that we impose upon builders and they, that they give to that. So, um, you know, the more things we can quickly do with the funds, the better. Um, I'm, I'm in support of your project. I think it's a great idea. Um, I appreciate your forethought in getting this. When you talk about designing the base down at the west end of the docks, I assume we always use local artists for that, correct, if at all possible? Certainly, and that can be the criteria we use. I think we made that agreement for a lot of the projects we're doing um, to either look for someone who is a landscape architect that can work on that or a mosaic artist. Okay, yeah, I think that should be the first, you know, at least right of refusal that we look for local talent for that and always yes. incorporate that in there. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy that, um, though this is not from Tarpon, it, it represents our culture. Um, and that was a great idea as well. So thank you for all the work that, that you do. And also the bike racks look great around town. I, 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 I appreciate you. what you all had to do with that. I think that's a nice little something different to look at. So I look for um, to see you all more often up here and for increased activity from your board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Siever. Oh, I'm very excited about this. Uh, we've been talking about it uh, as, as far as having something in the roundabout. Um, for as long as I've been on the sponge docks. So, uh, and I know we met, uh, the merchants met with Mark about four years ago. We've discussed having something on the roundabout and um, happy for the sales that are up there because at least it uh, produces some shade. But uh, I'm excited for this project and um, just can't wait. So I definitely approve. Um, as far as the mosaic, I, I just, it just might, came in my mind, the Londanos that are the, do you know that? store they do no. mosaic type work uh they had talked about doing something at the roundabout at, at some point and so i i just thought maybe that would be somebody uh it's a londano art studio they're on alt 19 and dodo canes um right. and they're very creative so that was just a thought but we'll check with them um, yes. i'm excited about the roundabout and about um the library or the old the <laughs> library uh so uh looking forward to it being completed <laughs> so thank, thank you. you very much and thank you for funding this Oh, thank you. Um, I want to thank the Public <coughs> Art Committee for being here this evening um, and for all your hard work and, um, and your vision for our community. Uh, art is so important to, to be placed within our community. And obviously, since you know, we've put the board together quite a few years ago, um, we've had some hurdles. But uh, I'm so happy to, to see that we're, we're starting to put the art um, throughout the town and this is this is just uh, <coughs> the work is beautiful the faces are so real on these on these sculptures it's unbelievable um, and I and I love the idea of the piece over at the uh, the original library I think that's a great spot for it I drove past it after I met with uh, Diane Woods and I'm like that's absolutely perfect I could see a light shining right up on it I think it's gonna be great um, I again I would I'd love to see so I do support this project, and this is a great idea, and I want to see more of it. I really want to see more um, art in our town. It really uh, livens up the community. It helps property values. Uh, it brings people to see these pieces of art to our community. People follow these artists. So um, I think this is exciting, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing it arrive here in Tarpon. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Carr. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Um, I've got a few questions. I'm going to take a little bit different approach than the rest of the board right now. Um, I really do appreciate um, everything that the art committee has done and the friendship that I have for all the, the members that I have gotten to meet and gotten to know over the past year or so. Um, so thank you for this. Now, this is one of 15 sets, right? Do you know where the other sets are? Um, I do not know where they are, but... Um... Mr. Uh, Selecki probably knows. He's the uh, owner of the gallery. Okay. Can you tell me where they are? Tell us. There's one set. Would you please come to the microphone? If you'd like to come up. <coughs> this, is, this is Mr. Selecki from Sarasota. Uh, yes, uh, Glenna Goodacre lives 
in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, she was actually born in uh, Lubbock, Texas. And there is a complete set of five uh, figures that span childhood to old age. And one of, uh, of the, uh, oh, we're talking about the, uh, the naiads. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, uh, um, boy, off the top of my head. See, the, uh, what I was thinking of is that the, um, the, the uh, storybook time or mother and daughter was part of a sculpture group that Glenna created in her hometown of Lubbock, Texas, that would span childhood to old age. And that particular piece, which is part of a group also, uh, is in her hometown of Lubbock, Texas, and also in, uh, uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where she lives. Uh, most of the pieces from the group of these that Glenna has done were broken up into pieces. Uh, when Glenna uh, created the Naiads, that particular set was her artist proof. It was at her home in Santa Fe. And uh, over the years, the 20 years that we have represented her, uh, we saw separate individual pieces from that, that group. And uh, this last set, Glenna has required that the set be sold intact, all four pieces, as she designed it, that was actually placed in her home around her garden and her pool in Santa Fe. And so now that she is retired, that was a requirement. When she was told that there was interest in putting it into a public place, uh, she was very, very uh, excited and happy, which is why she took the price that was initially $250,000 and then reduced it literally um, the $75,000 was what was she would sell each of the individual pieces. Um, but where the other sets, uh, complete sets are, uh, I don't off the top of my head know. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, so this isn't, this artwork isn't unique to Tarpon Springs, I think is the obvious statement here. Right. Um, you mentioned that it's going to bring people into town. Do you have any statistics to show uh, that back up the statement at all or anything along those lines? I don't have any specific statistics, but if we look at the art that is um, across the United States, I know um, New Mexico has mentioned uh, many people go to the George O'Keefe Museum because it's a recognizable name. Uh, in New Mexico. Uh, we go to New York City uh, to see the art there. Um, when uh, people that love art know an artist's name, they're going to travel just to see art. When I go to Maine, I go to Monhegan Island, which is 12 miles out, to see the Andrew Wyeth homes because I love their art, as do many others. Um, so, you know, I don't have any statistics, but I know this is a recognizable name. She has work in Washington, D.C. Um, so it's something that would draw people. And I think if not just the name, I think once people walk through and they see this art, it's something you want to come back and see again because it's live. Um. So something I did over the weekend, I researched bronze statues, um, and I'm not comparing these statues to the artist because I know the artist is a, an important part of it. And I do agree there is um, a certain part of having a well-known artist that, that attract people to come in. I understand that. Um, but when I found this website, I found that we could purchase as a city 35 different statues that are bronze from varying different uh, sizes, from small statues to six feet tall statues. Uh, that could be used in parks, it could be used in other public areas, 35 of them for $90,000. Um, and to me, I thought that was a pretty substantial difference between looking at paying 125000 for these two pieces, I guess there's six pieces total, and having an opportunity to get 35 other pieces for less than the same price. Um, I think what I would like to ask the art committee is that I would like to see, because this is 33% of what your budget is right now, and the other commissioners have mentioned we want to see other items coming before us. 
Um, I would like to see what other alternatives there are. I mean, that's a substantial amount of money, I think, for an area of town that doesn't have a whole lot of traffic. Um, I know the idea is to try to bring some traffic in that part of town, but to spend almost $100,000 in the roundabout, that's not a really a focal part of town. I don't think it's wise um, uh, use of spending of the money. And also to hit 33% of the budget of the art committee, I think it's also going to put a strain on other projects in the future as well. Um, these are just a few things that, by looking at this artwork, I'm not against the artwork. I think it's a neat opportunity, but at the same time, I think there should be other alternatives um, evaluated first. I think that's an important part. What can we spend this money on of alternative arts? Because we're having one option here. Um, like the bike racks, they came up and they showed us the bike, or I wasn't on the board at the time, but showed the board. Here are the bike racks. Tell us which ones you like, which ones you don't like. This option is, hey, here's a project, approve it or don't approve it. Um, I, we're really, we're not, we're missing out on the opportunity cost here. Yes, this is fun set aside for public art. It's good to have public art. I completely respect the board. I encourage public art, but I don't think this is a, a project necessarily right now that's appropriate for this part of town, for the amount of money, and um, what other alternatives are out there overall. Um, also, I'd prefer, I think, to see more of an artist, too, that's local, if we're going to spend this much money. That's a substantial amount of money, again, still, that I was um, referring to. Um, I don't have any questions. I, I just I can't support this right now due to the cost, um, and then not looking at any other alternatives available. We're just basically taking this. We're not looking at the whole public art picture as a whole. We're just looking at it as very micro uh, view instead of a whole picture, and looking at what what other alternatives are available, or what other projects we could do. Um, if we could look at maybe another project that's in this roundabout area that might not be as much. That's still a nice piece um, that could be commissioned of some sort. I'm not really sure what that would be. Um, but to really have a discussion about what else could go in this area would be, I think, a, a wise and prudent decision for the board. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to the public comments. Any public comments on this item? Please state your name and your address for the record, please. <coughs> Yes, Darlene Vetti, Kyoto's 49 West Center Street in Tarpon Springs. I am fairly new to the Public Art Committee. I'm not an artist. I'm not an urban planner. But I have found that I've learned a great deal by my participation on this group. I remember the last time we came before this group, there was concern by one of the commissioners that we were working too slowly in getting art around our beautiful city. And as you have said, Commissioner Carr, there are other options out there. But I feel, and I think I can speak for our committee, that we were ecstatic when we were able to get this quality of workmanship done by someone who was nationally known, if not internationally known, in our wonderful small community. And the problem being to go back to square one, start again, go out for different sorts of resources, all of this will take time. And what we hear tonight, at least what I hear tonight, is more art, quicker art, make us more attractive. And I appreciate your comments, but I very much agree with our, our chairperson um, that, that we have found something truly exceptional. And, um, and I think with the Greek heritage, with the water, the whole thing, I, I personally feel it's, a, it's an excellent uh, plan for our sponge dock areas. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on this guy? Sure. Uh, Commissioner Carr, um, I think you bring up some good points, especially when you talk about uh, using local artists. And that's why, obviously, when we talk about there's going to be a design base at the location at the, at the west of the, of the sponge docks, that we always give uh, first right of refusal to it to a, a local artist. If we discuss possibly a different location than the west of the, of, 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 of the sponge docks, would that cure any, any, any of your heartburn about this particular sculpture purpose? For the amount of money, I'm not sure right now. I'm, I would really have to think about where they would be. The sponge docks is fitting for the type of myst mythical goddesses. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the West End, 
kind of concerns me where it is in the roundabout. Yeah. And then also the base also concerns me too as like a um, mosaic of some sort. I mean, the stamp concrete is already blue there to begin with. A mosaic that's crushed tile. If it's something different, uh, it might be. It just seems like it clashes with the type of sculptures that they are. If you're looking at a crushed tile mosaic, it doesn't really seem to flow with the type of sculptures as well. So um, I really think it has to do with the price uh, and then also the location for sure. If it's somewhere else in the sponge docks, I think it could be maybe appreciated more uh, overall. I'm not against having anything down at the West End. That's not what I'm trying to say. But if it was maybe somewhere towards the beginning. In that area that would be an area that might be more fitting for more people to see and appreciate and also and just lastly i mean as far as when you when you when you talk about you know we could buy more for cheaper i mean i'm sure we could and you know, i'm probably the least qualified person on this board to discuss art okay but uh you know we have our public art committee and they i think there's actual seats they have we have for different professions in our on that committee you know i obviously i think the, we all do here on this board yield to them as far as selection of art because i have no knowledge of that area as i don't think many, many many of us do here on this board and i think you know the reason for the price is is what i'm assuming is the quality of it as opposed to just you know we can go online and find uh, 30 bronze sculptures you know that are different so um and i do think art does drive tourism um you know e e even when my wife and i travel she drags me to things she likes to see about art so um I, I am in full support of the board for this purchase, provided they do use local artists for any other things with it that need to be done. And that's a very good point. We should always look to local artists first. Um, but, you know, I'm not married to this location on the west end of the docks. If you had some other viable option and, and the committee thought it was, it was a good spot for it. But I, I just wanted to um, extend that to you and get, and get more clarification. Yeah, and that's the other thing too, Commissioner. I'm sorry, Mary. Did, did yeah, go ahead. Uh, there wasn't really any other discussions of what other areas of town. I asked the city manager to produce that as well. What other areas can we put these pieces of art that might get more appreciation um, within the sponge docks or other areas of town as well? So uh, there's been no discussion on that as well. Uh, uh, I'd I like to comment on that. Um, the uh, west side of the sponge docks is an area that we uh, actually invested quite a bit of uh, money and effort to, uh, uh, to help the businesses down there, to bring not only uh, visitors, but also to have the residents to come and enjoy the area. But bringing those statues down there, I think is gonna be a, um, an item that people are going to go there and visit and enjoy themselves. You mentioned about the price, and I agree with you. We always have to look for the best <coughs> price available, but we have four statues and $75,000, and it's less than twenty thousand dollars a piece i think it's very economical that you can go there and see it. um the pre the place is very uh, to me is appropriate it's near the water these naiads that's what they're representing and i think it's going to be an attraction and it's going to help the yeah, the business down in the area and that's what we're trying to do not only to attract the visitors but also to have a place where the residents, residents can go and enjoy themselves. This is why I'm supporting this. Commissioner Sibby, you have a comment? Uh, yes, Commissioner Carr. Uh, this isn't something that just came up like in the last year or so. It's something that's actually this committee has been working on for many years. And they've looked at I other ideas and, and other options. And it's been difficult to come up with the right artist or the price. Um, so I think the price is very reasonable. And the reason for the West End is because the whole conversation started by the merchants going to the city and saying, we need something that's a photo op or an attraction at the West End. All we have is this empty circle with benches around it. And we need to attract people to that West End because it's often ignored. So there are two reasons for that. You know, not only have they been working on this for many, many years, uh, but also because the merchants had requested that something be done uh, to, to attract some visitors to the West End. And there are other photo ops uh, on the sponge docks with other statues and um, sponge boat and, and other uh, attractions. So those were the reasons. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Commissioner. Before the city manager speaks, can I say something? Well, yes, I was going to say before I asked for a motion, Mr. Lequiz wants to say something. 
can I just I I just want to um, explain again, like like Commissioner Sieber says, this is something that's been ongoing for quite some time. It's not something that's just been thought up and we're buying a bronze piece of sculpture. Um, and we also directed this board, this committee, to uh, move along with 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 um, art within our community because they were very slow moving because they had a lot of hurdles to overcome in the beginning. There was a lot of things going on, putting the board together and structuring and stuff. So once they finally got going and, you know, it, it's, it's been, um, like I said, it's been one hurdle after another. So we finally got the bike racks. We've instruct, we were instruct, we instructed them, this board instructed this committee to bring us more art. And um, I know they looked at, they've looked at local artists as well. And it's not, it's not as simple as just um, calling, a local artist and see if they want there's just there's so much criteria they have to go by um and i truly believe that art brings people to your community look at what christopher still does for this community and look at how he's put tarpon springs on the map um amaryllis when she came you know people love to go down there and watch and see her and she's it, it just you know i'm i don't know a lot about art i really don't i could even draw a straight line if i had to <laughs> But um, I know what it does for the community. Austin, Texas, just pull that up and see what that does, uh, what, what they've done there. Um, uh, North Florida, I've been to some towns, and, and I've brought back some ideas. So, again, art just brightens up your community. It, it adds value, um, and it brings people. It, it's an attraction, and I think this is the perfect spot for this, this sculpture. Again, looking up art online and saying I can get six sculptures for whatever it was, $20,000. That doesn't mean it's quality. This is quality art. Um, and like I said earlier, just look at the facial expressions on these pieces. It, it's just, it's an amazing, I think it's a great opportunity for us. And I just, I just wanted to. I think okay. that's being missed. I'm not against public art. I've been to your all's meetings and I completely support the board. And that's something I completely encourage as well. I was just saying there's, it seems like an opportunity that if we don't have a, I don't know what the the full vision is, the full plan of, it's very piecemeal. I think we'll do a piece here, see a piece here, and not a full vision of the city for the arts of what we're doing for the whole city. How does this incorporate the whole city plan for public arts? And and so that's what I'm trying to say. I think we're putting maybe the, the wag or the horse, I'm sorry, is it the carriage in front of the horse? on this one just to say well, let's fill something here we found something let's put it there instead of looking at it as a full picture um, again i'm completely for public art i'm completely for having more public art throughout tarpon springs it's something i campaigned on and i would like to see more of but just for the amount of money and not looking at this, the whole plan just piecemealing it, i think i have some concerns about it so thank you mr liquors you want to say something so many probably want to know why the city manager wants to talk about art, because most knowing my history and stuff, you would think that I wouldn't be too knowledgeable. But there's three things that went on. First of all, I've been, I've been involved even before I was city manager with this vision of the livable, walkable community. Um, from the times we were doing the Tarpon Avenue route, taking over the state, doing Safford, doing the docks, and now finally, I get to see the finish, and as we come up, hope and grand and finish along the way. So I've been involved in that part from the very beginning. Also, Kathy Monahan assisted me because when we started the Public Guard Committee, I asked Kathy Monahan, I said, you know, I really want to take on as city manager some things that are nowhere near my expertise. So I want to get involved. I want to go to your meetings, and I want to learn because public art is just something that's at the bottom of my knowledge, and I want to change it as city manager because i got to be more diverse. So I've been involved with this committee, watching it, um, you know, working with it, seeing where they're going. That's the, that's the second realm. And, of course, Commissioner Sieber knows that from the beginning of the docks, people, four years probably ago, I've been involved in, in that and involved in trying to bring something to a roundabout. The roundabout connects with the walkable little, little community plan and because we've got the sponge diver figure in the middle, we got the sponge, that's our centerpiece of art. You see all the tourists, the picture, opportunities and stuff. So there's two other areas that we need to deal with on the docks when you're talking about the little walkable. At the beginning of the docks and at the roundabout. So two things that I've learned in all this time, learning and doing the arts. The first thing is 
we probably knew that putting some kind of statue or putting something nice, something something that'd be like the sponge diver in the middle, it was probably going to be at least forty, fifty, fifty-five thousand dollar proposition. We knew that four years ago. We talked about it. We talked about some different things. The other thing I've learned because at the beginning of this process, way back all the years with Public Art Committee, I thought, well, why are you going to do all this stuff with artists? Just go buy something and put it there. Well, you know, I quickly got explained and learned that that's not art. I could buy all these statues, but it's not art. I'm just buying a piece of work that's not an art. It's important on this walkable community that we're trying to come with that you have signature pieces, signature people, signature artists that put us on the map. That's why these may seem so much, but when you go on, we're figuring something we're going to get somebody to build at 50, and we get these that have such artistic significance for 75000 that's a bargain. Um, and the roundabout, um, probably with the water and all the things we've thought about doing the roundabout from filing and stuff, the water and the naiads matches. And maybe in the future, in the very near future, something will go that might connect that to the beginning of the docks. Um, that'll be something we do later, but it's an important spot to have those three spots in the docks and the walkable. Um, adding that statue and, and tying it to the original library, the other statue, and tying that to the original library, is just, those are the signature things we have to have. We can do a lot of things along this route. We can put pieces of art. We can get local pieces that aren't going to cost any much, but you've got to have those signature pieces, those, pe those pieces not only have meaning, but they have significance from the artist and stuff. So just to give you that history, since I've been involved in those three different aspects, all the history of it, I think that's the perfect place to go. And I think you're probably getting the bargain for these statues. And hopefully we're going to get some other developers pay a whole lot more money in the art. And we're going to replenish that art fund and have a lot more money to do those things. But that's just my 10 or more experience and my learning over the many years that the art committee has gone up and the four years of dealing with doc people to put that singer thing on the end. Next thing we're going to work on is putting a signature thing at the beginning of the docks, and uh, hopefully that'll be coming real soon. Thank you. Can I make a motion? I like to uh, also say that uh, I'm in favor to, uh, to purchase the uh, storybook time. I think it's going to be a very good addition to your library. Uh, like Mr. Lakota says, it's, uh, it's going to be appropriate. So with that, I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Is that going to be just for the statues, the uh, naiads, or are we going to include the uh, book story time as well? For the whole thing. And including the book story. Yes. Okay. Can, can I ask one other? I mean, can we ask to see the design? Because, again, it's art also for the base. To see what that design is going to be before it's in place, because we're still responsible to the board in public yeah. space to see what that looks like. Sure. Yes, they bring that back to you voting before. It's back. <laughs> yes, yeah. we're, we're voting for the mosaic yeah. also. But so I just want to make sure that we're aware of that. We want to see the mosaic sure. base before. We also like to see what kind of a base we're going to use for the uh, book story time. You already have that. No, we do not. Okay. No, but that's something they would bring back. The art that you're going to bring back later. That's something they would bring back. to you. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Orr. So we have a motion and a second. A roll call, please. Visitor Carr? No, just because of the cost right now. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Banther? Yes. Mayor Alahusis? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Um, Mayor, I've got a question, too, for the city manager. If, is this an okay time to ask him about public art? Well, what? I've got another question about public art. So if we are going to continue to collect public art, how are we insuring these in the event that something, someone blows through with their car and hits them all? I mean, if we keep collecting these pieces, are we going to insure them? Or is there a process in place to maybe we could look into it in a, a future meeting? But well, yes, that would be so, especially if we get some, you know, the purchase of this significant stuff, we would go to our insurance and, and, and we would do something like that. Yeah. Yes. It's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to the item number 90, which is a request to settle administrative fine or lien for 987 Sunrise Drive. City Attorney will present this item. Uh, yes, this, this is for the property at 987 Sunrise Drive in Tarpon Springs. The original date of the violation, code enforcement violation, was September 17, 2012. There were five citations on the property, all associated 
um, with the property being used uh, as a auto mechanic or auto maintenance. Um, there was debris on the property, uh, various cars that were inoperable, those types of things. Um, the date of the fine or the lien that was on November 28th, 2012. And the current amount of the fine or the lien is uh, $178,029.72. There's also a non-negotiable utility lien on the property for $2,246.54. And the current property owner, who is not the violator, uh, the violator was the previous property owner, but the current property owner uh, has offered to settle the fine or liens for $328.24. Uh, the city <coughs> attorney is recommending that we that the commission settle the fine or lien for $5,000 uh, plus the administrative costs of $575 in addition to the non-negotiable utility lien, um, which comes to a total of $7,821.54. Uh, we also request that the uh, current owner be given 60 days to pay that amount. If the amount's not paid, uh, then the fine will revert back to the previous amount. Thank and you. I can answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Vice Mayor Panther. Um, I mean, I just assume, all we can assume is that if the individual knew about these fines or a purchase, he did his due diligence. I mean, that's a common sense statement. It's um, on title. I'm sorry? It's on title yeah, and exactly. the right title. So, um, your most, your, um, your, uh, um, uh, 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 rec 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 recommendation was, was 5,000 plus the utility lien? 5,000 plus the administrative cost plus the utility lien. Yeah, the utility lien can't be negotiated down at all. All right. Commissioner Kick, they have comments? No, but um, Vi Vice Mayor, I just want to comment. Vice Mayor is correct. When you purchase a property, these liens are on your title. So um, they know they know what outstanding liens are there. Um, and of course, that utility lien is definitely not not is definitely not non-negotiable. Yeah. Or definitely not negotiable. There we go. <laughs> so uh, you know so. It is what it is. Um, so I, I, I support the uh, recommendation from the city attorney. I agree. For the record. Yes. Commissioner Carr. Um, again, a wild card on this one. Um, I just want to clarify a few things. So <laughs> this property sold for $36,100 in a foreclosure. Um, that's about $28 a square foot. I don't know the pop. The, the, status of the house so that's a well below market value uh you can barely buy a lot in tarpon springs for that price right now um and it was a foreclosure um if i just take a hundred dollars and multiply that by 1300 square feet which the house is it's one hundred thirty thousand dollars. so although in the letter that this individual said to the board he didn't know about the lien against it i you're paying pennies in the dollar for this property. It's uh, built up a significant amount of lien against the property for many, many years, and it was a nuisance. Although this is a different property owner, they still were able to negotiate it or get the property for a well, well below market value price because of these liens. I would say if they didn't have these liens, they wouldn't have got the house for $36,000. Uh, in the back of it stated something along the lines of this property owner isn't interested in flipping the house. Um, if the board feels comfortable with the $5,000, I think we need to put some stipulations in to say if the house sells within one year, then these additional liens would need to be paid. And if the house sells within two years, there would be a reduced, reduced amount. I, think we can do that. Um, I talked to the city attorney, and that's something that can be written in to this. Um, for the protection of what the property owner is saying, I don't know if he's actually going to flip the house or not. Um, I sympathize for someone that buys a property that has liens on it, but for how substantial these liens were and how much of a discount this property owner paid for this property, I think $5,000 is a complete deal. Um, and he's making out completely and this money in his pocket. So, um, Weighing those two options, I, I think if the board is more apt to say $5,000 is okay with them, I think we need to put some other stipulations into place. Um, if the house is sold within the first year, that it's $75,000, and it's sold within the first two years, and it reduces down to $50,000, and then after two years, it's released. Something along those lines. 
think. Could I add something? I actually was curious about where this house was located, so I did drive to, onto that street, and I wouldn't think that those houses would be worth what you're uh, yeah, considering. I, I did $100 a square foot, which is well below market value as well. Market value is around $150 a square foot, so that's why I used $100. Yeah. In the backup, there's the uh, tax record, and the comparable sales for the area for that type house is 80700 yeah. Again, those are not, you can't use those as comparable sales. It's not a real estate value. I'm just showing that there's plenty of value here that this owner has in the and house. This is what I do for a living, and we would use that number before we do anything. And it's high or low, about 5000 or so like that, but that is extremely close. Those are comparable sales, sales for the area. You don't, use the, um, you don't use the assessed value. You use the sales comparisons. And it's eighty, a little over eighty thousand yeah, dollars. So much higher than thirty-three thousand. Yes. Yeah, but not a hundred dollars a square foot. Sixty-one thousand, like he's saying. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I'm hard to believe that there's any property in Tarpon Springs going for sixty-one dollars a square foot right now, um, which would be surprising. But hey, I mean, if the board feels comfortable giving this applicant or this um, individual all the money, that's fine. But I think there's an opportunity here to protect the city and still capture some of the funds. Um, if we want to hold the applicant to what he says, then we'll put, okay, 30000 for year one and 15000 for year two. And after year two, there's no additional liens of any sort. But it's up to, I mean, I might be the minority on this one. Okay. I also support the city, media, city attorney's recommendation. Are there any public comments on this item? Here, non. I will entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve the, the city attorney's recommendation, the total fine, the 5000 plus administrative costs, plus the utility lien of $7,821.54. And roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? No. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Vice, sorry, Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Banther? Yes. Mayor Alahuzis? Yes. Thank you. And we are now going to item number 10, which is the ordinance 2017-34, adoption of Florida building code. This is a second reading. Ordinance 2017-34, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending Chapter 6 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs. By amending Section 6-1 to adopt the 2017 Florida Building Code building, the 2017 Florida Building Code residential, the 2017 Florida Building Code existing building, the 2017 Florida Building Code energy cons conservation, the 2017 Florida Building Code accessibility, the 2017 Florida Building Code plumbing, the 2017 Florida Building Code mechanical, the 2017 Florida Building Code fuel gas, the 2017 Florida Building Code 6th Edition Test Protocols for High Velocity Hurricane Zones, the National Electric Code NFPA 70 2014 Edition, by amending the 2017 Florida Building Code Chapter 1 Administration, providing for modifications that may arise at public hearing, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date by title only. Thank you. Staff report? There's no new information from the first reading. Uh, Anthony's here to ask any questions, if anybody has any questions on it. Any questions? No. Comment? Any public comments on this item? Here or none. I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. We're all called. Please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Panther? Yes. Mayor Lahousis? Yes, thank you. We are now going to the item number 11, which is the resolution 2017-39 budget resolution for fiscal year 2018. City Attorney will read the resolution. Resolution 2017-39, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the budget for fiscal year 2017-2018. Thank you. Staff report. Oh, here you are, right? How you doing? Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Ron Herring, Finance Director. Budget Resolution 2017-39 is being brought before you to budget for items that were not previously budgeted for in fiscal year 2018. I've tried to summarize in the two-page cover letter what is in the 15-page resolution. The majority of the items to be bring for, brought forward were approved and budgeted in fiscal year 2017, but not expensed in 2017. 
The items are open encumbrances at September 30th, 2017 in the amount of $4,927,441. Donation balance is being brought forward, $206,600. Capital items budgeted in fiscal year 2000, but not started, uh, $4,506,920. Other, other items that have come up since the beginning of the year that were not budgeted, budgeted for, $516,490. And with that, I'll be open for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, I really don't have any questions. I just want to thank you for taking the time <coughs> to uh, discuss all this project with me. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, 2017 was a very productive year for us. We able to complete many projects, even though that we had some challenges due to the hurricane. Uh, those carryovers are projects that most of them are in progress, and the others are not. We're going to start soon. Thanks. Correct. Some were started, and they're in the form of encumbrances that are being brought forward, and some were not even encumbered, so we're bringing those capital projects forward. And like I say, they were all approved and budgeted in fiscal year 2017. Some of those projects are already on the spreadsheet that Bob already talked to us last, last meeting. Any commission comments? No. Questions? No. Any public comments on this item? I will entertain a motion. Approved. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Bather? Yes. Mayor Lahousis? <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Item number 12, which is the resolution 2017-44, authorized application forward for uh, forward Pinellas grant. Resolution number 2017-44, resolution of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, authorizing the filing of an application for grant funds through forward Pinellas through the planning and placemaking PPM grant pilot program, committing local matching funds, stating the assurance of the city of Tarpon Springs to complete the project, and providing for an effective date by title only. Thank you. Staff report. Thank you. Uh, Karen Lemons, Economic Development Manager. Um, Forward Pinellas has created a grant program for municipalities to um, fund activities for us that will help um, help the character of the communities, help our communities grow. This year, um, it's called a Planning and Placemaking Grant. Um, obviously, we wish to apply uh, this year. Uh, got together with the Planning and Zoning department and I'd like to thank Michelle Wagner, our city planner who really spearheaded this for us and talked about some ideas of what we'd like to do. Um, so looking at what the parameters of the grant were, we came up with um, Activate Tarpon Springs. It's based on the foundation that um, the city has really been forward thinking and creating the CRA and creating the SMART code, which was one of the first in, in the entire um, county. And now what we would like to do is to build upon that by having um, a professional market analysis done, which is an economic analysis of the city. Um, I shouldn't say the city, within the CRA and SpongeDocs area, um, a business retention and recruitment strategy, and um, a best and highest use development for two um, prototype sites that we've selected. One is on the sponge docks and one is in the downtown area. Uh, these are two high profile sites that we've been working to redevelop. Um, I think we've really been doing a lot of progress lately in the past few years with our development of the city. Um, but we have a lot to do and having a, a professional market analysis like this will give us the tools that we need to work with the investors, work with our developers, um, work with our business and property owners to have the hard data that we really need when we're looking at attracting um, hotels, we're looking at reinvigorating Alternate 19, um, we're looking at uh, redeveloping the Manatee Plaza, some of those larger projects. So it'll really help us to take the next step um, by having um, this data and research that we can use and to um, implement new strategies and um, have the tools that we need when we were going out and, and marketing our sites to developers. So um, what we have here is the application. It requires a resolution of support from the Board of Commissioners, um, and that's what we're here for tonight. We have the application um, in the packet with you. Also, we have the Tarpon Springs Chamber is going to be our partner on this. Um, they've agreed to provide some in-kind services because we'll be having a lot of meetings with um, property owners and business people, so they'll be helping us through their emails and through other um, focus group activities, charrettes and things like that. 
Um, we have been in contact with Forward Pinellas. Um, this grant does not require matching funds, but they have told us that um, they highly recommended it. So um, as part of the resolution, we are proposing, um, we're asking for $50,000 from the grant, and then matching funds of 25,000 from the CRA, um, 20 from the general fund, and then the 5,000 from uh, the chamber. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, and I wanna, I definitely support this resolution. Um, it's very important that we get this market analysis. As I share with you, uh, Ms. Lemons, that last week I met with a director of a large hotel and spa resort in effort to uh, bring a uh, large hotel here in Tarpon Springs. And his recommendation was, in order to convince the investors, you must have this market analysis. That's the only way that you're going to convince the investors to come here to Tarpon Springs. So I think we're on the right track. Thank you for your Commissioner Commons. Commissioner Kick. Thank you. I just want to thank Karen uh, for bringing this forward. Um, and as the mayor said, you know, we do need some sort of, we want to bring investors here to our community and, and um, some bigger projects. So we do need um, some sort of an analysis to show numbers and everything about our community that they need to know um, to hopefully sway them to come our way. So I think this is a great <laughs> idea and I will support this for you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Karen. Yeah, this is definitely something uh, much needed. Uh, we do need an economic profile of our city uh, to bring people into our city and then also um, to retain businesses. I think that's very important. Uh, business retention is almost as important as bringing a new business because if we lose them faster than we get them in, it doesn't do much good. So that's very important. Um, and, you know, what type of development we need to come into, uh, into Tarpon. So I definitely support it. Um, I'm glad that the uh, chamber is partnering uh, with us on this. Uh, and uh, yes, thank you. Mr. Carr. Yeah, I think it's a great idea as well. Uh, just out of curiosity, what are the sites and the sponge docks in downtown that are the target? The sponge dock site is a former Pappas property okay. and the kind of the surrounding the parking lot. And, and then on downtown, it's the Lemon Street. Lemon There's Street. vacant parcels on Lemon Street. We've always had a vision for that, but um, you know, haven't been able to to see that to come to fruition yet. So that's the site. Yeah, I I think it's a great idea, and um, thanks for bringing this up to us and uh, trying to get a grant for the city. Also, um, heating the instruction of it's not required, but highly encouraged for matching funds is also. Thank you for drawing that up as well. So, no further questions. Good, thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? Here none. I will entertain the motion. Motion to approve. Second. In roll call. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Banther? Yes. Mayor Lahuzis? Yes. Item number 13 is a resolution 2017-45 opposing strategy plan for US 19 Tarpon Avenue overpass. Resolution number 2017-45, a resolution of the City of Tarpon Springs requesting that the Florida Department of Transportation remove the planned interchange improvements on U.S. Highway 19 in the City of Tarpon Springs from the Strategic Intermodal System 2045 Cost Feasible Highway Plan. Requesting the Florida Department of Transportation to consider improvements to U.S. Highway 19 in the City of Tarpon Springs that do not include construction of a partially controlled access facility and instructing the city clerk to transmit a copy of the resolution to certain entities and people and providing for an effective date by title only. Thank you. <clears throat> Heather Erler, planning and zoning and staff to the planning and zoning director and staff to this application. This is actually um, a follow up to um, the executive director of Ford Pinellas made a presentation to you back um, about a month ago about um, the fact that this interchange had been added into um, this plan. And with that, um, the majority of the board here directed staff to work with um, Ford Pinellas to develop um, basically a resolution stating your position in opposition to that, um, that facility. And with that, that's what you have before you tonight. And I can answer any questions that you Thank may you. have. Thank you for doing the resolution. But i also like to uh, say that I, I support this resolution it is a way for the city of Tarpon Spring to express our desire and concern. 
desire to come up with the ways that we can improve the uh, US-19, but I desire to uh, not to build an overpass on the intersection of uh, US-19 and Tarpon Avenue because I think it's going to hurt the businesses, and we can't afford to do that. It happened to other locations down in Largo and Dunedin and other places. We don't want to have that in Tarpon. Thank you. Any comments? Any comments? Vice Mayor. Oh, I didn't. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't raise my hand. I know. I'm in support of this, obviously. I said so at the last meeting and or, or when it was presented. And I've been opposed to an overpass from, from, the, from, the, from the very beginning. I think it's incompatible with the entryway to, to uh, Tarpon Springs. And also from a, um, just, just, just a state spending perspective, I don't see how it, 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 um, it, it all makes sense to have, to have that kind of overpass on the most, well, I guess the county line would, would be the most nor northern intersection. But to have this, this far north of the county, Makes no sense from a state spending, um, you know, um, point. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm as well. So, I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to it from that end, and also because it's not in an, um, fitting with the character of Tarpon Springs, and like you said, would I think direct traffic, um, uh, uh, uh away from downtown. I think. Commissioner Kick, I didn't. Did you want to say something? No, no. comments. Commissioner Sibra. I agree with Vice Mayor Banther and and you, Mayor. Um, I, I was surprised after we. Uh, talked about this at the last meeting. I did have some citizens tell me that uh, they supported the overpass. Um, but as uh, Vice Mayor Banter and, and the mayor said, I definitely think that our businesses would be affected um, and that would be a, a, a bigger problem for us. So um, I do support this proclamation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> now I'm not going to support this. Uh, I'm still going to stick with what I said the last meeting. Um, I respect you all on the board. I'm not. <laughs> there's obviously multiple items that I've gone a different direction with tonight. Um, I do feel that it's a safety aspect, uh, and it's also I just don't have enough information to, from a study standpoint. Uh, another thing I noticed that is it doesn't address any of the left-hand turn lanes uh, along all, uh, US 19 as well, which is a pretty dangerous. Uh, thing to have, and that's where a lot of the accidents occur as well, too. Um, but I'm just gonna stick with what I said after the last or during the last meeting, and I'm not gonna be able to support this one. Okay. Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? We hear no one. I will retain the motion. Motion approved. Second. In roll call, please. Commissioner Carr. No. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Banther? Yes. Mayor Lahousis? Yes. Thank you. Item number 14 is a discussion item regulation of medical <coughs> cannabis dispensaries. Dispensaries. Heather Earl, our again, Planning and Zoning Director and staff to this issue. Um, this particular issue we went through, if you remember, earlier in the year and adopted an ordinance essentially um, classifying this particular use um, and allowances for this use in the Highway Business District. The state came behind us and changed the legislation. We no longer can restrict it um, to highway business. It basically needs to be regulated. If we're going to regulate it here in the city, it has to be regulated as a pharmacy use. So short of rewriting your entire pharmacy legislation, you have a choice where you either would ban the use completely from the city um, or we would need to um, get some direction on amending the ordinance because we don't we can't use the criteria that we set out in June. So that's really what we're here for. And I can answer any questions that you might have. That's why this is a very brief memo because it's really a, a, a very limited discussion at this point. Thank you. As you uh, stated on June 12th, 2017, the Florida legislature passed the bill, SB8, a famous bill, which gives the cities two options. One is to uh, ban the medical cannabis dis uh, dispens dispensaries altogether, or to give uh, the uh, medical uh, cannabis dispensaries the same as the pharmacies, the CVS, and the uh, Walgreens. 
I just I just like to remind the board that uh, back in 2016, last year, 75% uh, of the people of Pinellas County voted to legalize medical marijuana for medical purposes, and uh, the voice of the people was very clear, and doesn't matter if we like it or not, we have to listen to the people, and we have to do what is their wishes. So I'm looking forward to... Uh, for you to take a look at the zoning and see how can you actually going to do that, what kind of uh, safeguards we need to place in there in regards to, to the zoning with the same, um, uh, I guess, the same areas where the, the pharmacy is already allowed to. Well, the problem is pharmacy is allowed in almost all of your um, commercial zoning districts, including your RO right by your hospital, um, which is right adjacent to a lot of your residential. So some of the provisions that we put in where there was a distance criteria between residentially committed properties, that's, out, that, that's not an option anymore. So as a result, if we go continue with these regulations, we're looking at dealing with pharmacy as a, as a different use, and then we're going to get into particulars of, you know, what district do you want to allow it in. Right now, you allow that in a lot of different districts because it's a use that's very consistent. It's a neighborhood business type use where a pharmacy moves into the neighborhood and it provides a service to that neighborhood. This is a little bit different of a, of a use that's now being classified under pharmacies. So... There is limitations on what staff can propose to you um, at this point that for your pharmacy uses. I can't restrict it out of out of specific districts without completely taking that use out of that district, and I've got to have a really good justification for why we're not allowing in that district. Thank you. So, Commission hmm. Kicker. Thank you. Um, as the mayor stated, it was 70 to 75 percent of the voters voted to allow medical marijuana, and um, I, I supported supported us having um, um, medical marijuana facilities here in our community. And I think that we need to continue <coughs> to keep thinking forward, and we need to find a way to make sure we keep um, keep our promise to people that need this. Um, and we need to look for a way to make sure that we keep this one of the you know, facility um, in our community. Again, it's it's medical marijuana. Um, uh, there's so many people that are using it these days, and there's more and more. Um, oh, we had a change in the guard. <laughs> change the guard. <laughs> um, there's just so many more people that rel are relying on it these days, and it's not like you're allowed to smoke pot on the premises. This is, I think it's edibles, I think is what it is. Um, again, yeah, a highway business would, would have been the preferred place to have these facilities, but uh, I don't see that we have an enormous amount of people coming to Tarpon Springs to put in a dispensary. I just, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, there might have been one, one or two um, inquiries, I think, but... Other than that, I mean, it's not like we're going to have a barrage of people coming in and open up a um, dispensary on every corner. Again, again, I think we need to um, be leaders and um, and and just keep on the same path that that we had thought before. I know there's a way, a, the way, a way we can do this. I know there is, and I have all the faith in Heather because Heather can make anything happen. But we were told this um, actually by our city attorney when this first came around um, that legislature is, is going to continually change uh, direction with this. So, uh, so I'm sure we're going to expect another change and another, you know, down the road. But again, I think if we just um, continue to move forward and be the leaders uh, in our county, in, in our state, uh, there's only a couple of dispensaries around, so uh, I think this is still an opportunity for us. So whatever, Heather, you suggest, um, I, you know, we need to discuss this more before just saying no, and we're not, we won't accept it or accept them into our community. Thank you. Mayor? Yes, thank you. Uh, I was in support of this. I, I voted for this on, on, the, on, on the state ballot, and... Uh, I'm glad to say that Tarpon Springs was, was one of the first to discuss having these types of businesses here. Um, I've always said I think what's given at Walgreens is far worse than anything you're, you're ever going to get from a medical marijuana. It's true. It's, it's just a fact. Um, and I think they should be treated at, as pharmacies. But with, with that with that being said, I, I realize there are stigmas, and I would support 
whatever you recommend to us, knowing that it would be in line with surrounding communities and uh, with, the, as Mr. Kicka said, it's going to be ever-changing state law. But I would like to see it blend in as, as much as possible with surrounding communities and realize that this is not record, it's not just a recreational use like Venice Beach where people just sit out and smoke pot. This is for medical use. So I think we need to just have some, some common sense about it, which, I, which we have. Uh, I'm in support of this, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm, uh, it sounds weird to say it, but I'm excited to have this for our community, for our residents that desperately need this. Thank you. So does this mean that dispensaries that currently exist could also be uh, selling medical mar marijuana? Well, right now it's how they're, they're regulated at the state would as a pharmacy use. I don't know if a pharmacy, I haven't heard of any of the big pharmacies going after this use. It's really a separate use. Either, but it's just, just regulated curious. specifically as if it was a pharmacy. So the intention is to allow it in any district that you allow any type of pharmaceutical sales, compounding, any of that type of thing. Right. So we're not just talking about the CVSs. Remember that you're dealing with compounding pharmacies and other Current pharmacies. Um, pharmacy is a bigger term than just. Okay. Uh, well, I, I supported uh, medical marijuana myself, and I and again, we're putting it all on you, but um, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> we we need to come up uh, with uh, with our own uh, way to do this. Or. Thank you. Uh, it makes sense to, for these to be classified as pharmacies, essentially because this is for medical use only, right? Can you just explain this to me? Dispensaries cannot be located within 500 feet of public or um, private elementary, middle school, or high school unless city approves location. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that part. Yeah, um, you have control over that. They they wrote into law there there's certain specific areas. So that, what we did was we actually put in more than just that. We looked at residential uses and that type of thing to wanting you wanted to classify it out of those areas. We don't have that same flexibility. So there's this limit, but you would then be allowed by as board as an act of the board to vary that standard. So if somebody came in and they wanted to locate closer, you would have to take that up, but you would decide as a board if that was where you wanted it. Other than like having pharmacies are approved for these zoning districts or zoning, I mean, there's really no other regulation that we have, right? Correct. Right. There's nothing really special about pharmacies that's nothing different than other com conditional uses or other commercial uses. Some districts it's required by conditional use. Some districts it's required. It's just an allowed use, of, a permitted use. So they would come in and get a site plan if it was a new building. Um, if it's a, an existing building, they would come through the regular building permit process. And if they're not adding additional square footage, you might not even see it. Okay. And the 500 feet was set by the state? Set by the state, okay. correct. All right. Thanks for the update. Thank you. We are now going to the uh, public public comment. If you please state your name and your address for the record. Yep, Tommy Frayne, six two four Penn Street. Uh, just as your resident civil libertarian, I felt like I should come up and say something. Uh, so yeah, so SB8 was passed. Um, I sent, I believe I sent an email out about Orange Park and how they handled it with putting pharmacies into the ordinances. Realize that's uh, a little bit of a pain. Um, but if you think about it, um, you know, these dispensaries are likely to go to highway business districts just by their nature um, in order to be a successful business and be profitable. Especially if there are going to be other communities that restrict them, they're going to want to get to an access point so people from all over can access them. So I think it's going to be a little bit self-regulating in that uh, in that sense. Um, and we have to remember the state somewhat overcorrecting from some of the mistakes that other states have made. So they are um, you know putting in a lot of restrictions, a lot of inspections regarding signage, the look and feel. Um, of the location. So, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of restrictions in place. So I know, you know, it'd be great if we could have uh, still have a little bit more of a uh, of a hold on where they can be located. But um, I like I said, I think it's gonna be more self regulating than anything else. So thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? You know, well, thank you. This is only for discussion. Thank you all. Okay, we now go into the item number 15, which is the appointment. 
to the Public Art Committee. <clears throat> Here we have one reappointment and three vacancies. Uh, recommendation one is to reappoint uh, Sherry Award to another three-year term. This term will expire October 31st, 2020. And to appoint the uh, two uh, um, alternates that we have, uh, Mrs. Vacciotis and uh, Mrs. Spring, to uh, uh, unexpired term of um, uh, October 31st, 2019. So we can do one at a time if you, uh, if you would, please. Any, uh, you guys, any, uh, you agree with our recommendation? The number so I assume one? it's just, it's not, it's not one and two, it's one or no, two. No, we're doing no, one, one right one now. Two. One, one and two. It's one and two. One and two, but right now we're Everybody just talking about the one. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm good. I'm good with one. You okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Are you okay with that? I'm good with that. All right. Um, then the two is to uh, we have one uh, vacancy for uh, regular member, which expires October uh, 31st, 2020, and to fill two alternate positions. Both of those positions will expire October 31st, 2019. If I just may say, there, 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 there's one error on here that Joan Jennings was in the Assistance Academy. Yeah, as that well. should be it should yeah, be corrected. It was the second one, I think. Actually, we have two members. Jules, Jules also was. Yeah, we have two, Julie Academy. and uh, and Jennings. They were both from uh, Citizens Academy. So, I'll start with you, Vice Mayor. Um, I mean, they're all going to get on the board, so yeah, it's just three. a matter of when. Um, you know, I would um. You know, support. You want me to list the, my my three and what row I want them? Is yeah. That like the uh, which one you want to be a regular member? I would member? do um, Joan Jennings for the position that will expire October thirty first, twenty twenty. Um, being for her involvement in a in an early assistance academy and how she volunteers in a in an artistic way with her photographs for the city. That's my um, uh, a reason for that. And then we'll put um, uh, Julie to fill the alternate one position and Rod to fill the alternate two position. Everyone's on the board. Okay. Commissioner Kicker? I would agree, agree with, with those recommendations. Yes. Commissioner Steve? I agree. Commissioner Carr? <coughs> Me too. Me too. Oh. I also agree with that. <coughs> now I need a motion to that effect. Uh, motion to approve to reappoint Sherry or uh, to another three-year term, appoint Dolly Vaticotis to fill the unexpired term of Michelle Wagner, and to appoint uh, Jack Spurk to fill the expired term of Lynn Pearson, and then to appoint Joan Jennings to fill the expired vacant position, which expires uh, October 31st, 2020, to appoint um, Jules Eichmeyer to fill the alternate one position to fill the expired October that expires October 31st, and to appoint Rod uh, murder to fill the alternate two position. Great. Second? Second. In roll call. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kikta? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Vice Mayor Panther? Mayor Alhuzas? Yes. Thank you. Can I make a comment real quick? About comment? Yeah. It, I think we have an unusual situation that just happened here. Um, Michelle Wagner is actually a city staff now, to, so to see someone from our board go to become a city staff, it's a pretty <laughs> unusual situation, but I, from a City Commissioner standpoint, um, I went to one of the boards and I thought she presented herself very professionally. So I think it's a great asset for the city that we're able to hire full time as an employee. So I'm excited to, to see her continue to do work for the city as a paid employee now, not a volunteer on the board. And she was Citizens Academy. And she's doing a great job well. for it. Citizens Academy, too. Citizens Academy, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we're now going to the item number 16. This is also a discussion. City signage, lights, Commissioner Carr. Thank you, Mayor. Um, vice, what is it? Um, Mr. LeCour has provided us with some uh, pictures here. Commissioner Carr. Oh, you did? Yes. Okay. I spent this weekend uh, traveling around town taking pictures and had a great time doing that with the nice weather we had on Sunday. <laughs> 
Okay. You picked all these, Commissioner? Uh, you know, I didn't take the ones on the street signs that have, like, Pineapple Street, but all the other ones I took. Uh, and But the lights, again, I didn't take the picture of the lights. Those were in other cities, and I took those off the internet. Am I okay, Mayor, to start? Sure, go ahead. Um, I wanted to bring to the board's attention uh, a few situations that we have an opportunity as a city to address, I think. Um, with the signage, there's going to be three different topics that I want to bring up and have a discussion about. Uh, the first one is going to be um, our signage and city buildings and city parks as a whole. The second one is going to be wayfinding signs that we have throughout the city. And then the third one's going to be um, our street signs and how we have our street signs today and the opportunity to improve them. So the first packet, I believe, it's, it's the picture with, and I have copies here if anyone from the audience wants to see them. Uh, you've got the pictures of public spaces, city hall, public works, city clerk, splash park, the osmosis plant, the recreation, um, the heritage museum, Union Academy, Academy neighborhood, Sunset Beach, the golf course doesn't have a sign right now. Um, multiple areas in Tarpon where Welcome Tarpon Springs no longer has signs either. Uh, and when I put them all together, we have 19 different signs as a whole for the city of Tarpon Springs. Uh, with looking at this and having a business background and experience, we're really missing the whole branding of Tarpon Springs as a whole, looking at Tarpon Springs. Uh, I think we have an opportunity to tie in all of our public spaces, if it's a park, if it's a public building or whatever it may be, to make it all cohesive and all have the same look and also pull in some type of artistic fashion as well. What I would recommend is that we come up with a sign um, that has and incorporates the, the, fish of, the tarpon fish. And the fish actually got connected to the street signs. Um, Similar to what we see at in front of the library, you've got a, a large tarpon in front of the library. And you could use the tarpon as a vertical part, potentially, of the sign, and then you could take the sign off the tarpon. Uh, if it could, be a, a, it could be a metal artwork of tarpon, it could be more ornate and more realistic like the one in front of the library, uh, but really incorporate the tarpon springs and pulling the tarpon springs out of using the fish tarpon and the fishing community that we are. Um, and then really branding the city throughout the Tarpon Springs by incorporating art and the signage as well. So I want to bring that to the board as a discussion topic. Uh, one, just to bring in a similar sign, which we have 19 different ones right now, and just bring to your attention as well some opportunities to incorporate art into our signs and some of our history. Is that, is that it? That's it for the... the the first topic. And I just asked a question of the city manager. We did sign a signage um, something a few years ago. I mean, the signs that we have now, they all fade and everything. They look terrible. It's the wayfinding ones, I think. Yeah, that's yeah, the wayfinding yeah. one. The wayfinding ones. So they're um, pre me. So yeah, they're about probably ten years old. They're horrible. No, they they were done when I was sitting on this well, board. Um, yeah, I think Renee here. put them together. Yeah, but. They faded and everything. They look terrible. So, and those all match. Those all had the same look. You know, look. They all were the same. So, I understand where Commissioner Carr is coming from. Where, you know, if we had, didn't we have a committee for that? I think. I remember yeah, correctly. we did. We yeah. did. Mark, do you remember that? <clears throat> no, but we did. We did because you and I were. were yes. Yeah. Were, no, but, it. but again, so, the way fine, and that's why this this item, you know, we have been looking at that we need to redo those wayfaring signs. That's on a list of projects, um, future projects. We don't have funding or anything else. That's not in budget or funding, but that is a list of redoing the wayfaring front. So this would be a good time to discuss, do we redo them in the style we did? Do we change, or what is that one look for wayfaring? And I think that's the same thing we want to talk about with these other signs. Do we want them because our the way we've done in the past, we've kind of made the sign conducive to the area, not the same theme. Do we want to still make signs, for instance, like the North Safford Park type sign, which we made for the area? 
we want to have one type we do all the city signs or we want to make it individual for the area and stuff to go that's that's two of the things in looking at these that because a lot of these are on the list too to begin obviously not the north Safford because that's a new sign um and we gave that the park look um but some of these other signs these city signs i know the mlk sign we've had up to look at replacing pretty much with that color theme we did because that's kind of the color theme we did for the imprint and stuff so that's why direction wise in the wayfaring sign we need to do you know since before we bring it to staff and do a study you know do we want a different look for them or do we do it and then of course the second issue of these signs we're talking about you know how do we want to do the replacements or if we want to replace all the signs at different facilities that you see pictures here they brought you pictures yeah. of I, yeah i think the wayfinding signs is a whole different topic those could be maybe be unified i, I really like the north safford park the splash park the dog park because they look the part of those parks but you know but they're new but you know you're right some of these other signs definitely some of them need, need to, to be, be replaced a lot of them are damaged yeah or missing oh look at the one at the heritage museum i mean yeah that's it's ugly. We've been talking about replacing these signs now for a while. Yes. Uh, we just haven't been able to budget it. But we're getting we're getting close to doing it. That's why as we start getting to doing, we need to know what you know. That's why what we want you know we're looking for direction before we come back to you. Which ones are? I know he's going to get to another subject that we've been talking about the the street signs. Um, but kind of the purpose, Commissioner Carr Brand here is to, you know get all the different ideas and what we want to work on, what order we want to work on, and what kind of, of look, you know, or just, just discuss between, you know, the five of you who will make the decision, what type of look are you walk, wanting for these? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to thank Commissioner Carr for bringing, for bringing this forward. I think um, uh, it's, it's very much needed that we have cohesiveness in our signs. Um, some of these signs, you know, predate me as a, as a toddler. Mm -hmm. And I remember even I tried to, for my Eagle Scout project, uh, redo one of the uh, – Welcome, welcome to Tarpon Springs sign. I think the one, I think it was the one off Ultra 19, but Anita got it finished before. Of course, she's not here tonight, the one night. She got it finished before I could apply to do that. Um, I, I really think we should have a standard, as you can tell, like the city clerk sign and the Riverside Park sign and the, um, I think it's taken down now, but the city hall sign um, have that old, I'm not sure what kind of look that is, but the, that old look. <coughs> we should have a cohesive, platform that we use going forward just as any business would for marketing purposes i do support that for smaller signs not for city building signs but for smaller signs i'm fine with them being unique to the neighborhood like union academy or or safford park or the dog park um but i i, I think it's a great idea that we do set a template uh, especially for city building signs and signs that aren't specific just to, to one uh culture of an area of the town that they do look uh the same and you know i though we do run a tight budget and we're bracing for the the homestead exemption we do have funds to um to start uh having a uh, a plan in place or place these signs and i i, I think commissioner carr is correct that we should start to do that and have a plan in place to have a template to do that again like i said an earlier uh, item i have no artistic taste so i <laughs> I yield to my colleagues, and I'm sure we want to get some input from the Public Art Committee, perhaps, on what one should look like. But I think that tarpon fish is one great idea. But yeah, I think that this is great. We we need cohesiveness in our signs, and uh, I, I would support that moving forward. Thank you. Maybe this could be a project for the Public Art Committee. Hmm. Definitely their input, sure. Yeah. Something that we can um, may not see it for a while. Well, well I still yeah. think you need to decide look because. If you look at these different signs, do you want the modern, the for instance, the reverse osmosis water facility? Very nice sign, but it's my. Okay. Is that the type you'd want individuals there? Now that's out of the way. Would you want more? You know, the wood. You you kind of gonna have to steer to the kind of. Cause we got all different signs there. Which which ones to get us started? To even bringing something back to you. What kind of looking? Historic. Will you? In the historical district, some of these historical signs, I'm sure you're going to want them more historical than that way. Um, so there's a lot of different factors you got to look like when you try to make them cohesive in the different areas. You know, what are these looks do you want us to bring bring back to you? Which ones do you like, or which ones do you want to bring back? Thought to um, the board to the board was to really incorporate the tarpon fish, and that I mean that's part of our name, right? Is tarpon springs. 
and it, it's also part of an artistic view of the sign too instead of just a four by four with some colors on it um that really stands out and when you come into the tarpon springs it's an eye catcher saying oh wow this is tarpon springs and look at these these signs it's something that people will look at when they come in as well um so that's why i was going towards the tarpon uh i'm obviously open for discussion for any other suggestions but it, I, I think it would be a good idea to have them cohesive throughout the town um so you understand when you see that that's going to be a public space and that's another thing that will remind people when they see the signs it's always going to be a public space I think yeah, you talked about um, you talked about branding and and you know all our public buildings like vice mayor banther said maybe they could have that branding of the tarpon and but the entryway to tarpon springs maybe would have to be something that our art committee could come up with I hate that welcome sign to Tarpon Springs myself, uh, but maybe that's something that artistic that, you know, maybe we'd incorporate the Tarpon or something else, but um, uh, that might be something separate from the city signs. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. If I remember correctly, and uh, uh, Commissioner Kick to correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been quite a few years, we did have a committee that they worked on the signs, and it was a big discussion what. Uh, brand we're going to use it was a tarpon fish it was a sponger or was a city seal at that time if i remember correctly we selected the city seal city seal he's right am i right yeah so that's what we corrected mm -hmm. the last time uh but also we need to have that <clears throat> hey, we need to be consistent i think we should that's a good idea uh but we i think it's good if we have uh, a committee in place uh some volunteers or some professionals actually come back with some kind of uh ideas the planning and zoning mr liquors if you can think about that or some staff peppers either way but come back with some ideas for that in addition to that we also need to have uh, signs where we can direct traffic during special uh, events how we're going to do that uh we also need to have uh, a sign for the gateway uh, as you're coming into the city from the US 19, alternate 19 from uh, Holiday, yeah. and the other one coming from Palm Harbor. So that's, yeah. uh, I think it's more than just the science there. We need to look at all these things that we need. Yeah, I've and got them on. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. I think it's a very, uh, uh, a very important issue. But we do have to need some unity, definitely. Huh? Need, we definitely need some unity with the signage. Yeah. With um, the wayfinding signs, that's the second packet that I had here. Um, there's, and I, I know the city did do a project, and Karen informed me about that, having a focus group. But we still have, like, for instance, we have some that I put pictures in where there's the poles are sitting there <laughs> without a sign. Um, it's not really the most attractive. There's one in downtown. There's one out by the Sunset Beach. Um, like Commissioner Kikta has said, that they've faded. You can't read them. Uh, there are about three or four different signs that are out there for the wayfinding signs as well, too. Um, and it seems like the board is already talking about the wayfinding signs that that's an area that needs to be improved as well. So um, that seems to be. So we, if we could just go ahead and pass that one, it seems like we've already discussed that a little bit. Uh, the third one, I'm sorry, there's one other one I want to discuss with the wayfinding signs. What the mayor touched on also about special events is our downtown area. Uh, when I visit Dunedin or I visit Safety Harbor and some other areas, there's a lot of signage along the trail. Not, I mean, it's tastefully. And I think this is something that could be done tastefully along Pinellas Avenue and the bike trail to encourage to say um, boutiques, shops, restaurants, and breweries, something along those lines in an artistic way that point left and right or something along those in that area to encourage people to get off the trail, to get off the roads. Uh, we have one that's at the corner of Tarpon Avenue and Pinellas Avenue uh, that says downtown shops. I think it's in one of these pictures here. It's an older tan sign that points to uh parking and it says shops but it, it doesn't really it's not a really an eye catcher um but i would like to encourage the city to look at putting additional signage along tarpon avenue i'm sorry <clears throat> pinellas avenue and the bike trail to try to pull people off those the trail to go into the local shops while they're visiting our town uh as a whole and i'm not really sure what the thoughts are and also encouraging additional parking signs too for public parking Actually, it's a lot of different signage we so. have been talking about it because that's that's something that I've brought up lots of times uh, as far as uh, letting people know what's where. So, uh, and I know that Mark, you're 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 wanting to do this, but um, even on the docks, uh, 
at Hope Street that's what's what's up Hope Street, what's up Athens Street, what's after Hope Street, uh, those kinds of directional type signs that many cities have. Sometimes you see the, the pole with the arrows going in different directions, like in Dunedin, like what, what shops are in this direction. Oh, yeah. And the same thing with downtown. Yeah. I know that downtown has put some signage up uh, in the last couple of years of, of the different businesses, uh, but we do need more of that, uh, directing people to, and letting people know what's there so they you know, can have an interest in, in going there. So that's definitely something we've, discussed for a while now it just hasn't yeah quite happened yet <clears throat> there are some very good ideas i'd like to ask mr liqueur do you have the manpower to come up with uh, different uh, opinions and different uh, recommendations or we need to have a focus group what do you think probably right now i'd try to i'd like to try to take it on the staff right now to get some ideas back to you and try to get you know more of a consensus from the ideas we bring to bring the five of you into the focus of where we want to go. Okay. Um, some different ideas of where to go and then, then focus in it. Um, I'd like to probably try that first. Okay. okay. Any other? Uh... Yeah, thanks. Um, so this is obviously a lot of different items that we're hitting here, but all kind of in the same theme. Uh, the next one is talking about some lighting ideas for downtown and really to pull people's eyes through downtown, when I visit Winter Park, when I visit um, other downtowns, um, lighting's always an, a catcher. And then when I look at our downtown, we've done so much in downtown as a whole from the community and the private businesses that have come in. But I think we could still help encourage um, visitors to go to different parts of the town. Um, this last packet that I have here, um, there's two different things I want to talk about. There's lighting in the trees along Tarpon Avenue and the oak trees. Um, and we're looking at an option of, they look like Christmas lights, but they're clear lights that are that would be potentially on year round. Um, aesthetically, I think they look good. They they pull people's eyes um, to the trees also. And then there's also these uh, light bulbs I'm not, or large balls. I'm not really sure what they would be called or globes uh, that they can hang in the oak trees as well. Um, Naples have has something similar to this in their downtown where they're just large globes up in the trees. Uh, it's a little bit different um, just to, for an aesthetic purpose uh, to have some additional lighting. And then the third thing was looking at roads like Hibiscus, uh, looking at the bike trail along Safford Ave, and looking at potentially Pine um, or a couple other areas about doing string lights over the road. Um, something that wouldn't be like just hanging. It would, be, it would have to have guided wires. It would have to have permanent structures of like a concrete pole and a wire connected to that so it wouldn't fall down there in a storm or anything along those lines. But a lot of these pictures have that in this packet as well, which will show you, similar to Ybor City has something over there downtown where lights go across the road, and it's something that's aesthetically pleasing. These three areas that I just talked about is where they're off the main part of downtown. Um, so Hibiscus is an area that we have shops, and how do we encourage people to go down there at night? People don't really necessarily see it because it's not really maybe lit up as well. And if we have these lights over the road, it's something that's an eye catcher and saying, oh, what's, the, what's down this road? Let's go ahead and take a look. Again, it has that kind of cafe feel. There's cafes along that road. Um, Safford, there's an opportunity over the bike trail um, in our downtown area to potentially do something similar. And again, this is the old kind of string lights that go hang over the road. And then um, I believe it's Pine Street. Is that where the... the the parking lot's going <laughs> off that road. It's next to KC Barbecue and uh, Johnny's. Ring. ring? Okay, Ring. I'm sorry. Yeah. Although that's a, a truck route, there's still an area to, when I looked at Ebor, they're up high enough to where they wouldn't be hit. And there's businesses along that area, and it would bring additional lighting to the amount of foot traffic going in and out of the parking lot. Um, and these are just some of the ideas that I put together. And I, I think it would be something aesthetically that would be pleasing also at night and encourage people to different parts of our downtown that might not venture those areas um, without some encouragement. Some of our merchants actually have put lights in the trees on hibiscus themselves and have done some, some lighting. I know that we've discussed this before, Mark, lighting. <laughs> yeah. You know, the tree lights, I like the string lights. I'm extremely skeptical, don't like, and there's issues with safety, and the, the string lights are, are, are problems. But um, they could be because the legacy, um, right, completely. Uh, the trucks and whatnot. But I'll tell you what, on hibiscus, 
that string lighting would be amazing. Or in the trail too, just think you don't have to go all over Safford if you just did the trail also. And I yeah, I'm not sure how I'm we sure could do going over to County Park. I don't. Yeah, I we, think that would but, be a problem. But we, you know, oh. Hibiscus is our street, so I think, and that's a perfect little area to draw people to. There's, you know, everybody they did such a nice job cleaning up that street and 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 put businesses there and whatnot. I think it's. I wish we would have thought of that one sooner. But, you know, we're talking about downtown. Of course, I have to bring up the docks. Uh, it looks beautiful right now because of all the lighting uh, at Christmas time and and when we have events and the sponge boat is lit up. And I always think, why can't we always have it lit up like this? Because I know it's an expense, but it would be nice to have more lighting uh, on the docks as well. So I'm not sure what the next step would be um, if we, if I could encourage maybe just a, I would encourage the city manager to look at also those other roads that I, I mentioned um, for the string lights um, and to come up with an idea. Um, I think that would be a, a really, it would really create an ambiance and an aesthetic to the city at night that it's not there currently today. And then we'll just hash it out. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And for whatever things. But I mean, I would encourage just an open mind on how we approach this um, to see how it can be done and not necessarily county or not. Thank you. Thank you. Great ideas. Thank you. Mr. Licurious, you're going to take a look at it. I yes, sir. And if you put a dollars next to it so we know what's going to cost. Different uh, for all the signs and stuff. Mayor, yeah. again, I think maybe um, this is something we could present to the public art committee and have them make it a, some maybe some portion of this a project of theirs. I don't know if you want to bring it up to them, Mark, and just ask them if they want to take on a project of some sort of either the signage or the lighting or you know. That could be their next or even the, project. A design for the entryway into Tarpon Springs, a welcome to Tarpon Springs sign. Yeah. Something I just like a chance to staff to tag. And yeah, you're right. There may be I mean, some things we go out to, you know. They have money in their funds, so I thought, you know, maybe they'd want to. Because I think they that. have discussed helping with the entryway sign and yeah. the welcome to Tarpon Springs yes. sign. They both, they have interest. Well, again, in that would that. be the type of things. I have, yeah. And I had talked to, to them about the entryway sign I, right. and even the entryway sign to the sponge dock. Right. That's what I meant. The, right. The rod, anyway. And but, we right. need at least three, at least three, maybe four. We need one from the years 19 coming into Tarpon Avenue. Uh, one on uh, alternate 19 as you're coming in from holiday. Okay. And then one uh, and the another one is you're coming in from Palm Harbor on alternate 19, and as, as you said, going into the sponge dock. No, Jack, all, all those, the issues of all of them is land, too. Land, yeah. I mean, that's always been, that's, sure. that's, always that's why you see the one coming in at, at Anderson Park, way in past we come to the yeah. because that was the only place we were able <laughs> to have land to put if it blink, If you blink, you miss it. <laughs> well, coming you into the sponge it. docks is definitely important because people don't know where the sponge docks are even when they're on alternate 19. Yeah. They have no idea. That was surprising me too when I was driving around town this weekend. I was looking for sponge dock signs like that pointed, and there was like a small one when you come from the holiday side. There's not a whole lot of signage. And then when you go down Safford, there's like arrows with small signs that say sponge docks this way. But it's not like there's really no grand Very that says, hey, this is a sponge docks, you've arrived, or anything along those lines. Um, I know it's a sensitive subject sometimes for some people uh, around town to put something new, but. I actually have people coming to my store asking me where the sponge docks are. <laughs> I don't know they're on the sponge And docks. again, like with the landscaping, you know, we look for partners and stuff. And I know when we ever get something for the Pappas building, there could be a partnership entranceway with a sign and something for the sponge dock. You know, that's always been the hold up. Because that corner where there'd be a perfect place that's not owned by us, that's owned by whoever's going to take it over and run the thing. And so this, yeah, those are those are opportunities too where we may need to look again in those areas where you say if there's public private partnerships, sure. yeah. um, we just got to realize that most of the people who do that for you, if they decide to change or do things, you could put a lot of money into the sign and then have to uproot it later and stuff. But those would be some of the things we look at too. Um, but I know those locations you're talking about. The problem was a piece of land where we that that we 
own or could have use of. And but we can look at that again because that hasn't been looked at. I don't think in a long time. So mm -hmm. we can look at that too. Okay. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Clark, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And the other, I know you didn't mention, it, but another thing we're talking about, and that's on kind of the immediate burner. As you see from the street side, we're looking into downtown. Really forgot about One that. of the ideas we had was the was to start doing the in the historic district and stuff, doing those historic district signs that you see. That was uh, when Commissioner brought it up. That's something we had talked about actually internally, and one of the things we wanted to to move in. Now again, the walkable corridor and stuff to have to have a look. And there's several different looks that you see on here, and we can bring back some of those later. But we think it's important in the immediate future as we space these things out to start moving those signs and trying to get for the historic downtown and the the district to get those type of street signs as you see some of the examples in here. Yeah, the street name signs. I think it's a pretty, mm -hmm. it's a neat opportunity that we have someone on staff that can make signs now and yeah. to really differentiate when you leave and when you come, you see the signs that are different in that area of town. I think the HBB had some discussions on it too yep. at some point. So yep. it's encouraging as well. Mm -hmm. That's another area we're going to be looking at and bringing back to you. Great. Well, that concludes the regular session agenda tonight. And we're going to go to staff comments. Chief? No comments, Mayor. Thank you. Nothing here. Thank you for coming. Oh, of course. My pleasure. Thank you. As always. City manager? No, sir. Madam City Clerk? Nothing. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Uh, just quickly, um, I had my one-on-one -on -one meeting with Mr. Brad Brad Miller of PSTA, and I have two meetings now. Uh, you know, uh, no official board board uh, board board meetings there. Um, uh, Brad will come to speak to us <coughs> at the February sixth meeting here to give a presentation on uh, transit matters that pertain to Tarpon Springs, and in in, 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 uh, in particular things that will benefit senior citizens, as has been a concern for you for you for you for you, Mayor. But I think talking more. Last time he came, we talked about things that were in concept, like Uber and Lyft doing first mile, last mile, about um, some alternatives for our disabled citizens using Dart. There's there 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 there, there has been some positive um, advancements in those areas, and um, uh, and he will discuss those. He's also offered to do um, uh, training <clears throat> with the senior center, mm -hmm. so we could have um, you know coordinate later in the spring. Uh, training at the library that that you know for the seniors to use the various services, learn how to use the Uber app, the Lyft app, things like that that get them to their next bus stop. As well, I encouraged um, like Mr. Mr. Black has said, if there's any concern about specific <coughs> routes, um, if you if, if people can email me, then I can explore that. Uh, to Brad, that helps as well. We can address that when when he's here. But he he was very open to the things that or the concerns that we've had. So he'll be here February 6th. I'll do a memo to the board. I'll copy the um, Safety Harbor Commission and the Old Park Commission as well. Um, and uh, um, I look forward to, you know, do, doing all we can. Because like <coughs> was put out today in the public comments, we do pay the same millage rate that St. Pete pays, and we get less than half the service. So, But I think there's some positive things happening that could help, help, uh, 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 help that process out. So he'll be here on February 6th for a presentation. February 6th. Okay, good. Uh, just to uh, add a little bit more about that, the last time he was here, uh, we also talked about looking for a grant, and Mr. LeCourse was going to work with Mr. Miller to see if any grants are available for senior transportation. So I'm, I'm not sure what. Yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully, with these new rounds out there, hopefully by the time he comes, the new round of grants will be out, and hopefully we'll know if they're available or not. Okay, good. Thank you. I do have a couple things um, I wanted to ask of um, city manager. Um, first thing is on our next agenda or close to it um, or the following one, but I'd like it done as soon as possible. I'd like an update on um, how the contract negotiations are going for the firefighters. I know they're still in negotiation. They've had 10 or so meetings and um, I think I would like just an update on, on what's happening with that. And um, well, we'll probably be having an executive session sometime in January to discuss that. Um, 
when I get more information and we meet with them, we'll, it'll probably be it'll probably be an executive session, not in a regular meeting, but we'll probably have an executive session to to discuss what's going on because they did turn down the vote um, for the first con. So so we'll be doing that um, probably sometime in January. We'll get back and executive session for us. Yes. Okay. Because we'll I you know one of their concerns is there's at the at the table there's nobody there that can make a decision. It has to. They you know, that's present not whatever, and then that is absolutely then they not have to bring it back. That is absolutely not true. So that's why you know. that's false. They know it's false. Well, so so if we can, yeah, if we can get some uh, updates on that, I'd really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, my next item is. Can um, I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Since this is a contract, it has to be a uh, an executive session, all right? Yes, for us, this is a contract. Yeah, so if we can be updated somehow with the executive, when do you think that'll be in January? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, my other thing is um, I'd like to um, have the board, the uh, budget advisory board, review the numbers of if, just in case we are to purchase the Sun Bay Hotel. You know that had come up, um, and have them look at all the numbers that were presented to us. There was a whole packet that we had received. Um, this board, I, you know, I just think that this is something um, that we need another set of eyes on, um, and we have this board in place, especially with big expenditures like this, um, just to have them look at it, get their ideas and thoughts and their recommendations for us. <coughs> I think they're meeting in January. I'm not sure. I believe they meet in January. They are. I'm still not quite sure what, because we have got one final meeting to yay or nay this um, based on the information we give you. So I'm not sure what, I'm not sure you want, what you want them to do. Well, I want them to see the packet that we saw that had the appraisal, um, what the purchase price was, what the numbers were for putting in, if we bought it, tore it down, uh, put in um, parking lot, um, you know, and look at our budget as a whole and just give us their recommendation or just their advice or comments. Well, Did right they advise now, on the negotiations, though, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the investor with this, you know. Right, but what if that doesn't go through? Then if, it's going to come back to us. Yeah, then it will come back to us. Then we can, you know. So they don't meet year-round, the Budget Advisory Board. No. So this is going to be coming back to us shortly. So I would thought in January when they meet that they could take a look at that. I agree. Since this is coming back to us in February, the only time they would meet would be January before it comes back to us. So it might be good to get their advice. Well, I just want to tie this down specifically because really, if I don't have any information that I can give to them about what's going on with these negotiations at that time, I'm not sure. But that's, that's not what I'm asking for. I'm not asking for them about negotiations. I wanted them to, just in case it comes back and we have to decide, again, do we want to purchase this property? That's what I'm asking them to look at. It has nothing to do with the negotiations of... Just the plain deal of buying it for the price. For the price and all the other things, the appraisal, the, like I said, the, the contract, the breakdown that we had of how much it would cost to remove the, the building, put a parking lot there, the same, the same information we got. I don't. Doesn't matter what if there's negotiations going on of purchase somebody else probably purchasing it because if that doesn't happen, I I think that they should be involved in. Uh, and this is what we have an advisor budget advisory board for, is to give us their recommendation or. Do they advise us on the CRA? The budget advisory. They board? don't, but we're all, we're using general funds for this property and then we're going to borrow the funds to the CRA to purchase it. So I think that this has, and they have, and they have advised us on the CRA before. They don't always advise us, but they have advised us on the CRA before, but these funds are coming from the general fund and the CRA is borrowing these funds. Uh, I think it's incorrect. Not coming out. Coming from public works. Yeah, yeah it is. Going to public, or public, public works. works. It's, it's still. It's enterprise it's, funds. Right, enterprise funds. It's still, it's not all, C, those aren't CRA funds. So that, that's my suggestion, and I really would like to, the advisory board to look at um, what we had reviewed. 
I have one more issue. <laughs> this is for Commissioner Carr. It's not an issue. Um, I'm asking. You know when, when we look at site plans and stuff and you have some ideas for plants and trees and everything? Um, and I know you, you know, your family and, and they have expertise in this. So when you bring up some of the things that we don't know about, I don't know if you want to ask um, staff to put a picture of what you're recommending instead of what the applicant's recommending so we could look at both. And so maybe we could sit here and, and make a, a decision and support you because, but you know, sometimes I'm a visual person, so I, you know, want to make sure. I, I don't know if that's something you're, you would want to do or not, but. My only thing is you don't have pictures of the current uh, plans also. So how do you make decisions on the current plans without pictures is another There's thing a, that would There's usually add. a drawing of some sort. We've got a lot of issues to talk about in this because I'm really uncomfortable with these meetings, commission changing things on permitted uses. We're not dealing with conditional uses. We have criteria of what can go there. These people hire landscape architects right. and... We just got to discuss the whole process has gone with some of these meetings and we have never we have never scrutinized a permitted project like this in the history that I can remember sitting on the meetings from here and there. Mm, so we have to talk yeah. about from a group on somebody hire we make these people hire landscape architects and they come up with a landscape plan. Most of the times they don't bring those landscape art architects to the meetings because of the cost with them and then we're asking to change things for that instance. We're asking them to change things on the fly that are permitted uses. I just think we need to probably talk about this process a little more and uh and uh there's some areas for improvement I think in <clears throat> how the code's written with the selection of trees in that area I would be completely open for showing you pictures and uh about other trees that could be good alternatives to add to as long as they're current... an approved tree in our yeah, and I think to if we have a guideline, our guideline now is very limited. I think with the amount of selection, it's it's like a selection of these bushes or trees or city staff approval. Um, so if we had something a little bit more detailed of other alternatives that are out there, and then potentially removing a couple of them all as well, that might not be as great to use. I, I would be happy to provide pictures for that and to have a discussion. But also the uh, planning is not even worth. They're reviewing the other site plan and you were on there yeah so that information should be given to them before it comes to the boc you know what i mean that should be already looked at it it should be already reviewed during the, the process during the planning is on as well i should review it before it no, goes no 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 <laughs> i said i'm talking about the different species the different plans that are yeah yeah there. absolutely yes you know i agree well, that's something we need to yeah discuss more, I guess. And um, like I said, I don't want to put any extra, I think, extra on any of the applicants. We want to make it as easy as possible for them to come into our community. But again, you know, sometimes you have some other ideas, and it's hard for us to know. We can't even pronounce it, the the plant. Sure. So you know, then we, you know, I'm just, you know, what I'm saying. So I don't know. Maybe we have something we need to discuss. And okay, that's all I have. Um, yes, and well, as I said, I think the last meeting, um, I, I thought we were going to have a discussion item on plants. Um, and because I, I, I want to support Commissioner Carr in these changes, because I, I trust his expertise. But, you know, so I still think we should have that discussion item. But I think, you know, and this wouldn't just go for plants, it would go for anything. I like things to be done before the meeting as much as possible, just because with any change, I feel hesitant for doing a last minute change, especially if I don't understand it to an applicant. Because a like what was said to, to make this a split process for getting things approved in tarpon, and also if I don't know what I'm changing, you know that makes me that makes me hesitant. But I want to support Commissioner Carr's recommendations because I trust him mm -hmm. on what he's talking about. So we can a have some discussion. I'm I'm very visual. These 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 things help me. So we can have when we do the discussion on plants, have some visuals. But but as far as working them in with applications. <coughs> I think it needs to be done, not to put extra work on Commissioner Carr, but it needs to be done well, mostly before. So when they come, they're not surprised, and we're not surprised, and we can all support. Them. Right. And, and also that, you know, this is why we have the uh, planning and zoning, mm -hmm. and, you know, review before it comes to the BOC, before it comes to us. So this is items that need to be actually discussed with them. Mm -hmm. So they have that information they can look at as well. Yeah. 
Commissioner Schiffer. Yes. Uh, comment. I'm glad we're having an executive session because I also feel that we, we need to move forward with the negotiations. So I'm glad that we can uh, discuss this in January. Um, and I made a phone call today, <laughs> which kind of surprised me. Um, I had mentioned at the last meeting about resubmitting our plans for the dredge uh, to the state again this year because uh, they turned us down last year and I thought it wouldn't hurt to submit our plans again. And I had mentioned them to Bob Robertson, who was doing his presentation. Um, and I know that Kathleen Peters had, with that research vessel, had been turned down the first year, and, and um, the second year um, the funding went through. So I thought, well, why not do that? Um, so I, I called uh, Chris to get his advice for Sprouls, Representative Sprouls. And he said, well, what happened with the DEO? I thought y'all were getting approved. Um, and I said, our last letter uh, showed that, you know, said that we were declined. And then the mayor, you know, sent a letter in, uh, on 1030. Um, and I didn't know what had happened after that, but I didn't think we were getting the funding. So um, I called Bob, and Bob said he had not been able to get an answer from them all this time. So I called Chris back and told him that. And um, he said he would look into it. So the other thing is, as far as resubmitting, he said it might not be a bad idea, although the appropriations deadline passed two weeks ago. Um, no so that's not good news. <laughs> uh, but maybe we'll have some news from DEO, since uh, Chris has asked, has told me that he's going to look into it. We can see. But it might not hurt to try to send the whole package back to, to the state again and, and, and ask for the funding again either. So anyway, I I just found out this news, you know, right before I came to the meeting. So I wanted to to bring it up. Yes, Vice Mayor. Well, thank you for doing it. By the way, I spoke with Chris. I was going to get on the on the airplane. It must have been over a month ago then, and uh, it's kind of the same response. Um, I think we should still try and resubmit with with the, with with the, with, the, with the state, but I really think our focus. <laughs> Because we have the penny funding, we have to be realistic. Yes, resubmit. You never know what could happen, like 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 with a research vessel. But I think our efforts, the efforts of the Marine Commerce Committee and staff, really need to be with the congressman and, and the federal level and 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 and, 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 and uh, the approval. Beyond just resubmitting and following up with Chris, I wouldn't waste any more time with the state. We, without getting speaking of people illy, we've lost our edge with the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, and, um, you know, I don't think Chris Brawls has much influence in that area. So I think, you know, beyond just resubmitting, we should just focus on the congressional level, which is where the funding has to come from. Yeah, my recommendation is that we do just resubmit. So, you know, you never know. I mean, instead of us spending the money, if we can get the money, I'd rather get the money than spend the money. So, Vice Mayor, I, uh, I share your frustration. Yeah. And, but we should continue uh, our efforts to uh, maybe we get something from the state. At the same time, we're working with the federal government. Um, Congressman Billy Rakis is going to have a meeting soon, again, with um, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, director of the Army Corps of Engineers, and hopefully things will be on the right track. Good. Uh, he's waiting after the holidays, and he's going to let us know. Okay. I just, you know, since the deadline's already passed, I just think that this is something we should move on uh, if we're going to resubmit. And I, I did share that with Bob Robertson, so... Uh, just wanted to let you know. Holiday season, I'll refrain from saying anything about our state representatives or our state. But if anybody wants to call me and ask me, I'd be glad to tell them what I think of all of them. So. Be nice now. I am. <laughs> Holidays. Yeah, Holidays. Try not to burn any bridges. How do you feel about that? Commission Carr. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> for the question for the city manager, I just got a quick, I saw a press release today from the Tarpon Arts about um, Tarpon Springs Reforming Arts Center to get brand new lobby, and it looks like a grant from the Kathy Monahan Foundation. Yeah. Can you give us a little details on that? Yeah, it's just, they've been talking about it for a while, and that's one of the things that they wanted to try to fund is for our lobby in here to, to, to spruce it up. In, be um, in between the doorways and the doors, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's going to be great for City Hall to have that updated. So. Yeah. Thanks. That's the only thing Thank I you. Have. Well, I got several things I need to. Uh, uh, January 6, 2018, we'll be celebrating the Epiphany Day, the biggest celebration that we have in Tarpon. And I'm looking forward to see everyone at the parade. 
be nice. Church then at the parade. Uh, also, on the, uh, January 29, uh, 2018, at 10.30 a.m., in the uh, City Hall Auditorium, right in here, uh, Congressman Billy Rack is the ambassador of Greece to the, uh, to the United States, and I, well, we'll, I'm going to uh, represent the city. We're going to be hosting a forum open to the public. And one of the subjects that we're going to be talking about is the uh, goals and objectives of our sister city program, which is to exchange education, economic development, and culture. And I'd like to uh, invite my fellow commissioners, all of you, to be there if it's possible, and also the public. Uh, it's going to be open to the public. I think it's going to be very, very, very informative. With that, I'd like to uh, wish to everyone Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And to my Jewish friends, I'd like to wish them a very uh, happy Hanukkah, which begins today, December 12th through December 20th. And that concludes the regular session, and it's adjourned at 9.33 p.m. Before we go to the CR8, I'd like us to take a, uh, a short break, and we'll be back. Very sure. Five, ten minutes. Five minutes, please. I thought, I thought, no, I said eight to nine. <laughs> you guys will broaden this around. No, she already knows why she was, why she's attending tonight. She's, hey, the, she's the, finally the, out. the theory I heard was, I have seminal tonight. I have to be there for a development thing. Yeah, uh -huh. Sir, why sure, that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> <And, laughs> I almost shot you a text and was like, are you sleeping? <laughs> Wake up. No, I if I have to be a week, you have to be a week too. I can't even. I can't even. Ah. Hey. That was slick. Yeah, well, how'd you come in? That was slick how y'all changed the guard. That sounds That's how we do. Is she okay? She hasn't been well for the last couple of days. If you were at home, I'd have you do a run right now. Yeah, see, I'm dead serious. <laughs> messed up your run. I'd cut somebody for, for, for a Diet Coke. You can come? You don't. I've been sneezing a lot. Uh-huh. You're, though, though, you're quiet. I have my back to you. I thought, I thought you'd gotten up. <laughs> I had my back to you this whole time. I, you're, though you're quiet, I thought you'd gotten up. I divorced her for a reason. Sorry. <laughs> That's so funny.
Yeah, 29. You got any protein oh, bars on that <laughs> officer over there? I got nothing. What do I have over there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I will say it, that's a, it's, it's, for me, Christmas is my husband, myself, well, yeah, anything, and my daughter, I'm, I'm not so. picky right now. It makes it real easy. It also makes it kind of like... I've already yeah. had trail mix. Well, I got cake wow. over there. <laughs> this is good practice for the flight to, uh, to over to Ashes. Exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, be my own. I'm gonna be borderline cooler on that plane, and I'll be hungry. Oh my god! <laughs> I, 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 I still have to call John for the upgrade because we upgraded oh, the premium economy. I saw. Well, you better hurry up about the upgrade. I'm not sitting that. like this for nine hours. Right. I'll be standing in the back of the bathroom. That's okay. I'm my phone, you right now, is the youngest of eleven like children, and so I don't, some I don't of even his, know where, where um, our seats are. We yeah, they're probably the in the back of the tail. <laughs> Nieces and nephews. Are older than he is. That's but they went to the same I'm, school I'm gonna, yeah, within I, a few I, years I, of each other. I demand first so class. He would make them call him Uncle business. David <laughs> at school, <laughs> even though they're like two grades above him. And I was like, oh, you're a bunch of like, Yeah, so he. I know. Well. What? Yeah. No, 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 I say well, bad. not anymore. I mean, this yeah. was my dinner, so. I got it to the third. I'm not watching it. I didn't have yeah. Yeah. It's a nail buyer. It's shot so it's even. My buddy says the booze are like boxing them out. Yeah. It's the defense. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. playing that yeah. defense. Yeah. They're playing that old jersey. Backing. Yeah. There's a power play that I watched. Go wing. Go what? I said go wing. Wings. Hell yeah. Are you, are you from right there? No, I'm well, from I'm Southern. From well, I'm from Southern California, so I grew up with minor league hockey. We had the Gulf, and then then they left, and then they came back. I used South to work for them. It was a whole big thing. But my sister dated. This is dating me. Dated Chris Chelios' brother. So oh, yeah. I grew up being a wing. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I'm like, well, Chris Chelios, yeah. sure, all right, let's you get on that. Live here in Tarpon. The Dardarian, the bay, that, 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 that family owned a portion of it. They lived over, over in Harbor Water. Hmm. Yeah, but we go, we go to Lightning. We love the Lightning. I used to work for the Lightning, too. You did? Yeah, that was my dream. I wanted to work in hockey. You used to work for them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when they, when the, Makes when the Lightning was owned by Powell Sports and Entertainment, I worked for the Lightning. Oh, yeah. yeah, and then they had the CBA lockout in 2004, and I lost my job. Nice. And then they tried to hire me back at like half the price. And the latest rate. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, get Let's get it started. Tommy, can you give me some food? Drive through or something for me? Help me out. Medium fries. None that vegetarian yeah. stuff. You know, I eat meat. Okay. Yeah. Actually, it's funny we can't like a whole other commission meeting. I am now called to order the Community <laughs> Redevelopment Agency meeting of the City of Tarpa Springs on Tuesday, December 12, 2017 at 9.40 p.m. Roll call. Cheryl, who's this? Here. Vice Chair Banther? Here. Commissioner Seaborn? Here. Commissioner Fichte? Here. Commissioner Carr? Here. Okay. Consent agenda is item number one, approve the minutes for September 6, September 19, October 3rd, and October 17. Item number two is approve the attorney fees for Hellinger and Tobin D. Young. Any of the items that you'd like to pull? <coughs> no? Then I will need any discussion? Any public comments on this item? None. The chair will obtain a motion. Motion approved. Second. In roll call. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Pickett? Yes. Commissioner Seaborn? Yes. Vice Chair Bandler? Yes. Yes. Item number three is a CRA resolution 2017-04 approved renewal of lease agreement for three, uh, 325 East Lemon Street. The attorney, if you please read the resolution. Resolution 2017-04, Resolution of the Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Tarpon Springs, authorizing the Community Redevelopment Agency to renew and modify the commercial lease and option to purchase for the property owned by the Community Redevelopment Agency at 325 East Lemon Street by title only. Ms. Lemon, you going to give us a staff report? Yes, thank you. Um, again, Karen Lemon's Economic Development Manager. I think most of you were on the board or were aware um, back in 2012, um, we entered into a lease agreement with Silver King Brewery. 
um, to lease the former police and fire station at 325 East Lemon Street. It was a five-year lease with a five-year renewal option and then an option to purchase. Um, those five years went pretty quickly. We're back now. They would like to renew um, the lease, but instead of the five-year renewal, we're just asking for a one-year renewal because they intend to purchase the property next year. So we've been discussing um, that with them. So we have tonight for you is the, um, the one-year renewal um, that we're asking for approval for. And then um, uh, they've indicated they'll be purchasing the property sometime before August 1st, um, which that, is, that language is built into the renewal. And then we'll be bringing back to you at that time, um, if the purchase is made, we'll be bringing that um, back to you for approval. Thank you. I well, support to extend the list until August 1st, 2018. And I'd like to uh, say that I'm very glad that this business is doing well and they are uh, intent to buy the property. Thank you. PRA comment? Any, any comment? Uh, I'm for extending this lease as well and would also encourage any citizens that are watching or residents to um, stop by and visit this business if you haven't visited yet it's a pretty neat um asset to have in tarpon springs 103 breweries and then such a historic building that we have as well i agree uh to uh to approve this lease for another year vice mayor Pan. i just want to say thank you um which what, what you all have done is a shining example of a cra project that has gone very well um I, 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 I would hope this thing takes, I, I, I said Siri, I really hate that, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I just want to thank you, and, I, and uh, I'm very glad that you want to purchase the building from us, and uh, I, I always like it when I drive by there in the evening to see you open, and it's a very inviting place, and I just really hope that we can do more, more projects in town like yours, and thank you for visiting our Thank you, and, and you know, I echo my, my uh, fellow commissioners here. Um, I sat on the board when we negotiated the lease, and Karen brought this project to us, and it was a unique project, and um, and it seemed to uh, serve the community very well. You're bringing a lot, a lot of people into the community. I do visit there frequently, but I don't. I sit in the corner, um, <laughs> um, but I love it. And you have the fireplace going now at, at nighttime, and you've got some great bands that play there, um, especially when the Bearder Brothers are there. I love it. And it brings so many people from our community together. It's, it's unbelievable. So um, the beer is good, and, um, and I'm, I'm happy to see that, that uh, you want to purchase the property. Um, this property is, is unique for Tarpon Springs, and it's, you know, but uh, it's time for us to move on, I guess, and let go of it. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that you can purchase it, and I wish you guys all the best. Thank you. Thank you. You are purchasing a part or a history of Tarpon Springs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> are there any public comments on this item? Do you want to say something? Please come to the podium. You've been here this long. You might as well say something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John Troyer, uh, part owner of Silver King, 325 East Lemon. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you more than anything um, for the opportunity. Um, I know it took a little while to get started, but once we uh, got rolling, um, we're doing very well. Um, our distribution is up over 60%, which is, that's um, restaurants throughout the whole county. And that helps get the Tarpon Springs name out there because people in St. Pete Beach buy our beer, and then they ask, where's Silver King Brewing Company? And then the owners of those restaurants know, and they tell them, and they come up here. Um, people that come either haven't been to Tarpon, some of them haven't been to Tarpon Springs for a while, and they talk about how much it's changed and for the better. And then a lot of people haven't been here at all. And so, so we get a lot of that. And then um, I think the last thing I was going to say is that, uh, um, that uh, I think something that speaks to the community nature of, of Tarpon Springs is that uh, I think a fourth generation Tarpon Springs resident on New Year's Day is getting married across the street at uh, Christopher Stills' um, uh, art gallery and then coming across the street and having their reception on New Year's Day at our facility. We're going to open. We're normally not open that day. So I just think that kind of speaks to the whole community working together to just improve and, and kind of lift things up together. So 
That's all I have. Thank you. If you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um. Yeah. It's. it's I, would you please uh, state your oh, name? Brett, your Brett Gamrot, uh, co-founder of Silver King Brewery Company. Um, John Tor and I go back since fourth grade, believe it or not, and we're 49 years old and never believed that we would own a brewery together, but somehow we made it happen. <laughs> Brewing beer when we were younger, I guess. Um, anyway, we, uh, it, it's, been, it's been a really uh, great ride uh, so far, and we plan on growing. Uh, I'm in the brewery almost every day, 70 hours a week plus, uh, and, and it, it is really, really neat to hear people come up and say, you know, we you know, I bought your beer down at, you know, Safety Harbor, haven't been to Tarpon Springs in forever. And, and then they come up because of our name, uh, our name, all, you know, connected to Tarpon Springs and, uh, and they come and visit and, and that's been great. And, uh, really, really appreciated the, uh, construction of Ring, Ring, Ring Avenue and, and the parking lot behind our building, uh, coming along. And, uh, we think that's going to be a great, addition to St. Somewhere, myself, Casey Barbecue, Johnny's Tap House, and, uh, and we're looking forward to that project being finished. Thank you for getting that going. And, uh, and if uh, next year you want to extend the parade, you know, down Levin and make a left on Gross Avenue, that'd be great because we had a lot of people hanging out in the brewery uh, out of the rain <laughs> watching the parade go by. And uh, that's just a little, uh, little uh, what, what am I trying to say here, Lowell? Added benefit. Yeah, added benefit. That was really nice. And I uh, just want to say uh, thank you for everything y'all are doing for us. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. In, any other public comment? Uh, any other public uh, comments? You want to say something? I just wanted to say um, that you guys have really embraced the community and you work so well with the community with the yoga classes and, and uh, the arts and, and all, the, all the people that work with you guys to, to make Tarpon more successful. Thank you for what you do. Chair will detain a motion. First approved. Second. In roll call. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kickton? Yes. Commissioner Seaver? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Carol Hoops? Yes. Thank you. Good luck to you guys. Thank you. Item number four is the process and timeline for development of uh, 144 East Tarpon Avenue. Ms. Lemon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you recall, at the meeting in November, um, there were two proposals for the Forbes property um, redevelopment. Um, the recommendation from the evaluation committee was to reject both, and the CRA board approved that. Um, and at the same time, the discussion was to come back with a process and um, the vision for the property uh, timeline to do another uh, request for proposals um, under a process that the CRA would, would make a selection. So what we've done is drafted a, a process, um, a timeline, and uh, put together what was contained within the RFP that pertains to what we're trying to get a consensus from you tonight during your discussion um, that looks at the city vision of the property. Um, as you know, we, we've always looked at it as a mixed use project with the first floor commercial, second floor um, residential. Um, we've looked at the design that it meets the historic design uh, criteria. We'd like to have the property be developed front to back from Tarpon to Court Street. Um, you know, we discourage parking for, especially for commercial use. Um, the rest of the information under the scope of services is um, exactly the same from the RFP. Just gives some basic information about the site. Um, we're proposing a, a buyback provision um, in the event that we would get proposals that were approved by you, if you make an award, we would put in there a time frame that it would be a lease purchase agreement. Um, rather than selling it outright immediately, we would have a timeline whereby the, the proposer would have a portion of the building developed 
say the shell is at least constructed before we would sell it so that we could have um, an idea that the project would be completed. Um, and that's something that we had done similarly to another developer who had looked at this project and um, we had a two year agreement with them. They never obviously developed it, but the two years was a little bit long that we thought so. Um, we'd like to put a shorter time frame in there and have some benchmarks for progress before we actually sold it. So it would be a lease agreement and then sold at a later date. Uh, and then, the, and then the, the section three that's outlined there on page five, those are the proposal requirements. Those are the requirements that we had in the, um, in the initial RFP. Uh, it goes through what we would like to see in the technical proposal, which is basically their design and development plan. What are you gonna put there? Um, what's it going to entail? We've got a checklist of things that they need to provide. We wanna see a, a, a design, a format, a layout, um, addressing some of the elements so we know what it looks like. We'd like to see the elevations. Um, section B is our development team, so we want to know who their architect is, who their designer is, who the developer is, who's going to be the liaison to um, the city and have all of their um, references. Um, we're recommending that they have somebody with an architect that has a historic background um, because this is in the historic district and it's going to have to have HPB review, so that would be helpful uh, to their team. And then under section C is the financial analysis. So we want to know that they have the wherewithal to do the project. So there's a checklist of items that we're looking for from them. Um, with this, we're going to ask that they put it in a separate sealed envelope um, because all of these uh, discussions and presentations are not going to be open to the public as a CRA board. Um, there is a provision that the financial information cannot be disclosed. So that'll be put in a separate sealed envelope. Um, and then the business terms, and that's what they would propose to purchase the property, the dollar amount that they would um, be purchasing it with. So tonight we just want to have a discussion. Uh, as you look at this, are, you know, do you agree with these items? Are there anything that you would like to change so that we can be clear when we take the proposal out of what we're looking for um, from the development? Um, so the proposals come in. We're asking for the timeline, um, putting it out sometime in January, and then once it's out, having a 60-day time frame to allow the proposers to bring in the information. Um, some of that financial information is going to take some time, um, but we think 60 days would, would be a good enough time frame. Um, there's a 30-day legal notice that's required because it's being disposed of by the CRA that can run concurrently with everything. So we could put that that uh, legal notice in in January or February. Um, and then we've got the listing of when the proposals are due. Once the um, CRA would make an award, there are quite a few steps that um, submitting for the building permit, not sure how long that's going to take and when the construction begins and the actual sale of the property. So we didn't put um, any specific dates in there for you, but um, we do anticipate that with the approval of the agencies, we would have that completed by the end of the year. Um, so with that, you know, I, I welcome your discussion. Um, once we get the direction, then we'll move forward um, with the RFP and we'll be working with the procurement uh, directors to put together that RFP and to get it out. We'll be using Demand Star again like we did the last time. That's a national database that um, people subscribe to who have businesses that make bids and get bids. So that'll be a national distribution. We also have a um, an email list that we've been keeping track of for about the last six years of people who have been interested, developers, investors, business owners. So we send it out to, to our email list as well. Thank you. Just let me add for just let me add something to this. Kind of this is this is part of the document that we had. Um, we took some of the information from the meeting and some some information we've taken from individual commissioners and put this together. Um, this is adjustable, for instance, for the time. There are some who want a longer period, some shorter. This is kind of in the middle, but you can dictate that. 
if you give the approval for most of this tonight, um, Mr. Jackis can be getting starting on it immediately um, so we can get it out in the early portions of January as soon as we can. Um, if we can come to consensus tonight, don't have to bring it back, then you know, he'll be starting on it tomorrow to work and get all this this together. A lot of these things where you say March or April, again, it depends when we start, when we go. Um, the two weeks so you can kind of figure on these. It could be early in March or later in April, depending on how we do the process out. As far as the different criteria go, there's some of the basic criteria that you're going to decide on, but it's really going to be a simpler process. You'll set the time, the criteria, um, and then this board will hear the proposal. It'll be a simple thing. If you hear the proposals, you don't have to do a score. Isn't that which one um, do you want? If you want any to have that property and go, it'll be simple for you to listen to them. And then you decide as a board, you know, which one you think would be the best use for the CRA as a board. So while it's got a lot of the complicated stuff, it needs to be complicated because of what the people have to put the bids in for. It's really going to be a real simplified process. And for you, you'll be hearing and seeing the vision and deciding is one of these projects that are put in one you want for that property <clears throat> so just any input on on this um and again if we come to a consensus about the different areas this tonight i can get i can get them working on it uh, tomorrow okay mr lecourse Ms. lemons good job um the process the timeline and the criteria is exactly what i wanted to see i think uh it's very clear what kind of a development we would like to have there uh, we're going to have the mixed use and commercial and residential, just like uh, what the smart code provides. Uh, it's going to be a historic district guidelines, and uh, also we're going to develop the whole, the, the entire site. Uh, I like the fact that uh, the uh, uh, the Heritage Preservation Board, the planning and zoning, and of course the uh, the BOC are all going to be involved with that decision making. And also that the CRA will have the option to buy back the property if they don't if they don't meet their uh, agreement. Um, also like the fact that we're going to uh, make sure that uh, they have the technical ability as well as the financial ability to pursue this project. Um, I'm sure we're going to have an appraiser on this property, right, to know what's really worth. <coughs> we had it having several years back. We had it appraised in 2012, yeah. and it came in at 85000 We haven't appraised it since because um, our main purpose really wasn't to get a lot for the property. Our main purpose was to get a good <coughs> development there. So, um, you know, we've been negotiable on the sale price. So we didn't want to spend the extra money to get the appraisal because we're not asking for the proposers to pay full market value for it. I understand that. It's going to be based on what benefits the public will have, how many jobs will generate, and and also what uh, the value increase is going to be in the area. But also, we want to know how much uh, value the property has. Well, again, that'll be some opinion. decision on that. Again, the question is, that's going to be spending a lot of money. And the last two ones we had there was about giving it away. I don't think we're going to be able to close to to what these people have to put into the buildings. We're not we're not going to have that in. So. You know, it's just our opinion that's throwing good money away because we're, no one's going to come close to whatever the appraised value is on the offer that we haven't had it before and we've got to give it away. But, of course, that's the decision of the majority of this board if you want to go out and spend the money for that appraisal. What money are we talking about? How much money are we talking about? Do you have an appraisal done? 550 600 bucks. 600 bucks. Oh. No, I think Bacon. the last oh, one. That, that's last a, one was. It was two or 3000 Oh, that's right. Commercial. This is commercial. commercial. I forget it's commercial. <coughs> Yeah, yeah it, I think that's a waste no, of money. I was thinking like six, six or seven hundred dollars. No, it's, it, the last one was over two thousand. That's right. This is a commercial property, so yeah. they have to take a lot into account. Yeah. <laughs> so overall, I think it's good, and I appreciate the work. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Your opinion? Uh, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, <laughs> I, I support the mixed use. Um, requirement or part of the scope of this project. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is that uh, Ms. Lemons talked about it being two stories, but it can go to three stories in a conditional use, uh, and that would really maximize that area, and that's something that's in this um, scope as well. So I just wanted to reiterate that. 
Um, so even if a applicant came in with a two story that might not be residential, they could still add a residential on the third story to come in compliant with the scope. And we, we do have that listed yeah. on number three so that they know that. Um, the one thing I, I do share your concern though, Mayor, I mean, it would be good to have to say what the city's expecting to sell us at because if an applicant's coming in to say, hey, I want to spend X amount of dollars, but their budget only falls within this. And if the CRA is expecting to get $30,000 out of it, $10,000 out of it, or whatever it might be, it could pull them out of their budget. Um, so to have some type of clarification, I think is a, a good idea to put forward on what the CRA is expecting. I'm not sure if we can move forward with that tonight. Because right now it just says the CRA is negotiable. Um, so what happens if we come back and it says, they're, we're negotiable, but then they're like, well, I'm sorry, the CRA wants too much for the property, so we can't move forward with it now. That would be a concern I have with how it's written today. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else shares that same concern or not, but I'd be willing to listen to other comments. That, that could be something that you could include in terms of your, when the proposals come back, what you're thinking, you know, if somebody's proposing to pay 85000 that may influence your opinion on which project do you want to give? I mean, it's been public knowledge that we've offered to give the property away. Mm. For a long so time. How, well, yeah. For a long time, do that, doesn't understand. Yeah. Me. Yes, it's very important that we have uh, many benefits coming, benefits to the public, like what you just stated there uh, on a backup information, how many jobs we're we'll going to uh, generate and uh, what uh, values. Uh, when it increases the values we we'll have. Commissioner Stuber. Yes. Um, no, this is great, Karen. Uh, but they will be aware of the appraised value and could make an offer to them on on the property. I mean, the, when it you know, as far as uh, make their application more when they up. yeah when they apply. Yeah, they could offer to purchase it for 85. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, uh, is there somewhere where they can be aware that this property val is valued at 85? Yeah, it's on section one, the scope of services. That's what I was looking for. Which is on page three of my memo that gives kind of the, the summary detail of the property it, that it's served with water and sewer, it has no um, stormwater detention requirements. Gives the appraised value of the land area. Okay. Yeah. Just a reminder: we haven't been able to give this property away in four <laughs> years, so all, I'm not expecting any of them to have a substantial amount of money um, on the in their bid to go forward. I'm not expecting. You shouldn't have expectations. Being to see optimistic, that. the economy is a little better, so. <laughs> I, I, I'm just telling you, don't expect to see that because people haven't been made been able to make it viable. Giving it to them. Right. So. Yeah. Any other comments? No. Vice Mayor Panther. Yes. Thank you. I, I, I want to thank staff for the very quick turnaround on, <laughs> on this. That was impressive. Um, and I, I'm very glad that we'll be reviewing these applications as a as a board. I think that's the appropriate way to handle this. So I'm I'm very pleased for that. Uh, I, I want to clarify and correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, Heather and Karen. Uh, mixed use doesn't have to mean a residential component, correct? Mixed use could be anything. It could be office, commercial. It could be yeah. It could be retail and a restaurant. It Oftentimes, could... we always think mixed use. It has to be, which, in my personal opinion, when it's safer when we have uh, applicants before us, you know, we always think we have to have apartments on top and a business on the bottom. But it can mean many different things. But mixed use, like it says, not just one single use for the property. Correct. And that last sentence can be taken out of one under city vision. Um, that last sentence, that's just been the thing before. Obviously, we've seen it hasn't worked and we haven't had one come through I, for that. That's my so, opinion. It should be taken out. So that can be taken. Maybe not taken out, but not made. I don't want to take it out. I mean, but not. Well, made. it says residential, and then, then it says the city's vision has been. And or. I maybe use and or. I don't want to remove it and, and not encourage a residential mm -hmm. aspect. I mean, it doesn't. If someone can make a plan, it certainly can make sense, but. I think we're going to move away from the failed idea that it has to. So I'll maybe just put and or. I don't want to take it away, but I don't want to make it sound like it has to be. And that's my only point with it, with the mixed use. That would be one thing. Um, my only other change would be is we say on-site parking yeah. for commercial use. 
realize if we did residential, we might have to tweak that a little bit. Is um, it's not encouraged. I would say it should be not should should not be allowed. Um, we're, we're, I mean, the old building was a zero lot lot line, with the exception of Teddy's next door, which is not a good example. There's no on-site parking on Tarpon Avenue to take out the Mother Mears parking lot. So I, I would I, I would change that to for commercial use. I'd be willing to if we did have an applicant that had a good application for us with a residential component. I'd be willing to entertain something for residential, but for commercial use. I would say no, no, no on-site parking to encourage the maximum use <clears throat> of, of that property. Those are only t uh, tweaks that 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 I have. I'm very comfortable with with the timeline, um, and uh, I think this is great. Again, I'm very thankful how quickly you all turned this around. Um, I, I I think it's very important that we do this correctly and that we get somebody in this space. Uh, so so uh, so thank you. Okay, Commissioner Kick. Thank you. Um... Yes, Karen, the, the, you guys got this back to us really quickly, and, and um, thank you for that. I thought this was gonna, going to take a lot longer. Um, I do have a question about the, the <clears throat> timeline. Proposal is advertised 60 days, 30-day legal notice. So, so they have, so an applicant would have 60 days to get us a uh, packet. They would have 60 days to get to you all of the information that's under that section three proposal requirements. Is that, do you really feel that's enough time? Is 60 days enough time? Um, if you want to get a farther reach as much as possible, you could extend that timeline. Somebody who hasn't done this before, it can take, it can take some time to pull that information together, get your team together, <coughs> get the renderings, get your financing in order. Right. You know, I was thinking who's... maybe more in the line of 90 days, but I, you know, I'm leaving that up. What, how you, what do you feel about that? That would probably allow for more people to respond if you had it longer. That's what I was thinking. Because there's a lot to put together. A lot to put together. Um, and my other thing. Oh, when it comes to the appraisal, like Mark said, we couldn't give this property away. I mean, we were basically offering take the lot and build on it at one point you know so i don't think that um so we need to negotiate with with the people that want to you know make an offer and so they know that we're that um we're willing to negotiate price so for us to spend which i don't think we should be getting an appraisal anyway it's usually the purchaser that gets an appraisal um at that point you know you know when you're buying a home if I'm buying my home, I get an appraisal. Um, so I'm not sure that the city, city should be paying money to get another appraisal when we have one. And, and I haven't, I didn't get to pull up the tax records on the, do we have the tax records on the property with the just value is or the? Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to remember what it is now. It's a hundred something. So I mean, so we have that. So we know that we're below appraised value. And do we really need to maximize and again, we tried to give this property away and nobody wanted it. There's, there's so many restrictions that whoever wants to build on this property is going to have to, it's not restrictions, but there's a lot of, um, it is restrictions <laughs> because they have to go through the HPB and there's a lot, there's a lot of guidelines that they have to follow. So it, you know, um, I just think that we should just, Go with it, whatever we have for the appraisal is at eighty five thousand and go with it, and then go from there because I can guarantee that we'll probably come down on that price mm -hmm. at some point um but again, I think ninety days might be more um I don't know what the board thinks here like do we have content for ninety days yeah I would yeah, agree I think that, that would help, but other than that, um I like uh vice mayor's recommendations as well. thank you thank you. Any public comments on this item? Any input? Here none. Ms. Lemon, do you have the uh, recommendations? Yeah, I just want to make sure I have everything. Um, you like to go to 90 days for the proposal to be out um, under the city vision. Um, on number four, you want to say on-site parking for commercial use is not allowed. I'll, I'll see if we can. 
because I know it's allowed in the smart code, so I don't know. About the maximum use of, would use in all the property? Yeah, we're, we're, that's part of our, yeah, we'd like to see it constructed back to back. We have that in here. Um, uh, and then the and or residential, just to make the distinction that is not. I like that. Andor. It's not, it doesn't have to be. That was a vision, but it doesn't, because it kind of reads like it, that's kind of the way to go. So the residential is just one of the options of the three, four, five, six mixed uses we did. I think just go them all together. Okay. I think those were the three, if, if that's the. Mine's just the parking for commercial. I, yeah. I don't want to see commercial parking yeah. on that property. If, if, if it's residential, then I'll, we, so we just know, can entertain just, that. But for commercial, no. I no agree. Park. Okay. okay. They all agree on those. And the and or part. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Okay. Can, can I just, there's one other, under the city vision, there was, it talks about first floor commercial, second floor residential. And I know I mentioned that in the scope of services that it could be two stories and then a third story conditional use. So, I mean, I would think that this somewhat, the city vision could somewhat include that if there's two levels of commercial, I know an applicant that was applied last time tried doing an application for two commercial floors that there would be an alternative to do a third floor under conditional use but that would still be in the city vision that a, re a, res a residential or mixed use would so still you want be. that portion moved up to into there i would i mean i would say that because right now it says first floor commercial second floor residential and so if we have something that comes in that has a, a design that shows two stories of commercial and then a third story residential it then at that turn puts them in a negative so light. Mention the ability of the third floor up there in that item one. Or... I think for City Vision to have a third floor, a third floor wouldn't be a bad idea. I mean, it could be more residential area, or it could be. I'm not really sure what it could be used as. So. I support that because I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I don't want it tied to residential. It has to be that residential yeah. is a, is a viable option. It's just not, right. it doesn't have to be. That's failed us. That's you could have business, you could have retail second yeah. floor, and you exactly. could have restaurant third floor. You could have any of those type of things. Yeah. So just putting in that ability of the third floor. So but, essentially mixed uses are multiple functions within the same building. It could be retail. It doesn't have to be residential and something else. Right. That's your point. Okay. So and we have three. Has, it has to be a condition of use, though. Right. According to the, uh, the well, that's what you know, we're going to say in there. The, they're the third floor available on conditional no, use, so, use the, yeah, so yeah. that they know it up in the requirement. Just to notify them of that, we'll put that up into the one. It's somewhere else in the document, okay. but as you know, these documents have a lot of pages. So, and if that's the consensus and that's the direction of the CRA board, we'll get putting the formal process going and get it out as soon as January as we. Erica, do we need to do we need a vote? No okay. consensus. Just consensus. Fine. Okay. Consensus so the we will work as fast as hopefully as fast as we got this together. Well, it's a little more complicated getting the bit up, but. With the same speed, we'll try to do that so we can get it on the market as early in January as we can possibly get all this written up in formal form and get it out. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Karen. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes the CRA meeting, and it's adjourned at 10.15. Right. <laughs> all right. We cover a lot today, you know. Last one. We don't have one for four weeks. <laughs> we still have a meeting for four weeks. But you know, we have presentations. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, that. Thank you. Of course, my pleasure. <laughs> I always enjoy coming to Tarpon. Yeah, it was good to see you too, Jacob. Merry Christmas, guys. Glad to see you. Oh, you were here? No. Oh, Merry Christmas. Can't believe it's already December. Take care. I have it. I wrote it down. I know. I am. I tell you what. I had it drafted. I didn't say that. Uh, but she's just stubborn, so. Thanks for covering. No problem. Mm -hmm.